And yeah, yeah, bring your uh, coaching team. There's an opening right down there, Brandon. So I'm gonna read a little bit about why we've got all these young folks here, and then I'm gonna ask Brandon to help me. We're gonna call the names. Mm -hmm. We're gonna call each one of you up here alphabetically, so kind of pay attention to where you are alphabetically, so we'll know what order we're gonna call you. We're gonna give you one of these little certificates. A mom or dad, or you wanna take a picture, you can come right up to the front here and take a picture, and then uh, we'll get a speech by your coach to talk about what happened. Then we'll do a group shot. That sound good? Yeah. Okay, good, because you guys are probably anxious, maybe to go watch a hockey game tonight, <laughs> right? Okay, so I'd like to welcome the Niagara Falls Flyers Novice Double A team. Raise your arms so we know where you are, guys. Okay, good, because we couldn't tell. <laughs> this year they captured the Novice West Double A Championship in the Ontario Minor Hockey Association. The Niagara Falls Flyers entered the series undefeated in the playoffs with a 4-0 series sweep of the Garden City Junior Falcons in the semifinals. The Flyers were poised to play the Bell River Canadians of the Blue Water Hockey League. The first two games were held in Bell River, with Niagara Falls coming out on top 3-0 and 4-2. Before meeting Niagara Falls, Bell River had only ever lost once before at home all season. Pretty amazing. Game three was played before a packed house in rank four of the Gale Center with Niagara Falls completely dominating, resulting in a 5-1 win and a 3-0 series sweep to earn the OMHA championship. I'd like to say on behalf of the city, on behalf of city council, congratulations to our Flyers. You did a great job. We'll get uh, the coach, and there's the list. So he's gonna, as he calls you up, I'm gonna, we'll call you, come in this way. You come right here, I'll give you a certificate. We'll shake, hold the certificate, pose, picture, and then we'll bring you in here. Everyone got that? It's pretty simple. Right, let me grab a bunch here. Hey okay, coach. Thank doing? you. I'm, I'm just gonna call them by That's where, they, where they're sitting on the benches. So we've got uh, number uh, 24, Elia Mores. Yeah. I, I mixed that up before too, buddy. Is that we got someone here to hold this for fun? Come closer. Thank you. Thanks very much. We've got our our goaltender, our rock, our superhero, number twenty nine, Sam Schubert. It's easy crouching down. Thank <laughs> you. We've got right winger number 19, Ethan Cayuet. Thirteen Cole Roberts. This way. Left defense number seventy seven, Boston McVicker. Defense number 88, Riley Dugas. Left defense number 98, Eric Boom. Got 
goaltender, number 31, Carter Robbins. smile is permanently applied to my face. <laughs> uh, center, number 34, Matt Yursich. <laughs> right wing, number seven, Justin Yursich. Center, number 16, I like to call him our captain without a C, Jacob Vanny. <laughs> At left wing, number 8, Jack Brown. Wing number four, Liam English. On right defense, number nine, Carson Bay. Number 87, Tyson Stevens. And Zima, so we back just for any of the other players out here. And for the yes. coaches. Hold their breath for the coaches. Yes, we, we do have. So we'll give, well, you'll take them all with you. Yes, thank players. You. So maybe you could just, maybe, uh, well, yeah. listen, wait, let's first do a group shot. Yep. And then uh, get your cameras out. Come on, guys, it's all kind of fish short. Smaller guys in the back. Leo, Leo, Jack, Eric in the back. Allison, yep, Matt, Riley. Three men, yep, right there. Push in, push in, push in. Push in, push in, boys. Nope, here. Okay, thank you. So maybe, Coach, you can share a few words with everybody here. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and the boys and the, the parents are, gonna, are, are getting tired of hearing the story, but I'll tell it anyways. So uh, when I interviewed to coach this team, uh, I told the coach selection committee that I didn't know if they would win a single game all year. Uh, we have zone AAA hockey in Niagara. Uh, so we have the Southern Tier Admirals, which includes Niagara Falls and Welland and Port Colburn and Fort Erie and Wayne Fleet and so on. Uh, and generally they only have four or five, maybe six or seven Niagara Falls players uh, playing for the Southern Tier AAA. Well, at this particular age group, they took 10. Uh, so we were left with, uh, I thought, we didn't know we got some we got some good players come back into our association. We picked up a good player from House League. We got some underage players, and we sort of cobbled them all together in tryouts last April and May, and then we started working in August. And uh, we never stopped working all year. We lost our first two games, six nothing and six one. And I thought, boy, it was gonna be a long season, but they never quit, they never gave up, they worked hard, they listened to their coaches, they worked hard both on and off the ice. Uh, and uh, after November 1st, I think we finished something like 11 games over 500 after November 1st. 
Uh, we uh, swept our opening, uh, our, uh, our semifinal series against Garden City, as, as we said. And then we had a long stretch of time off uh, while Bell River and the teams in the West sorted themselves out. Bell River ended up playing the Windsor Junior Spitfires in the semifinals over in the West. Uh, and Bell River uh, came out on top. They swept uh, Windsor in three games. Uh, so it was uh, two, uh, two teams uh, undefeated uh, meeting. And Bell River incidentally had their record coming into the finals in, the, in league and playoffs was 30 wins, four losses, and three ties. And again, they'd only lost one, one time ever at home all year and not in the arena where we played them. So we went in uh, as the underdogs and uh, I remember that scoreless first period. First period scoreless and we thought, you know what, we can play with this team. And then Jack Brown scored the first one for us in the second period to put us on top one nothing, and it was uh, and it was all uphill from there. Uh, in game two, so we won game one three nothing. In game two, Bell River came out and they scored two quick ones in the first period. And I think their fans thought, you know what, now we're getting back to where we should be here. Well, we came to the bench after the first period, and the coaches told them, boys, don't give up, keep going, keep going, keep working. We came back and scored three in the second period. Paul Roberts and Elia Mores and Jacob Vanny scored uh, two quick ones for us to tie up the game. And then uh, <coughs> I think it uh, might have been uh, Liam, did you score the uh, third goal in game two? I think you scored the third goal and we ended up uh, scoring once in the third and won 4-2. And then we came home in front of a packed house. I, rem I still remember that first goal, Matt Yursic came, came and made a move and blasted it. Right, right over the goalie's glove to put us up one nothing, and we never looked back after that, uh, and ended up uh, winning a five one and uh, taking the series as a heavy, heavy underdog. But uh, we played Niagara Falls hockey. We got pucks in deep. We worked. We grind. Um, we never quit. Um, blue collar hockey that the city of Niagara Falls would be proud of, and uh, we're very proud as a coaching staff of these boys. And uh, I know the parents are very proud of themselves and, uh, and uh, they deserve the red hats and the medals that they got. And we'll be in the OMHA Parade of Champions in June. We'll celebrate again then. We're gonna get rings. Uh, but this is a fine, fine group of players and young men and a fine parent group. Thank you. Okay, could I get everyone all rise, please? Is uh, Aiden Ty here? Aiden Ty? Yep, he's back. Oh, come yep. on up, Aiden. Don't want to come up to the microphone. We are in virtual. I'm gonna let me just read a little bit about you, Aiden. We'll just sure. get that door closed, and then we'll uh, kind of find everybody's on one side of the room here. <laughs> Aiden has been singing since he was eight years old. He's been involved in a number of community theater productions throughout the night region, including Yellow Door Theater, Linus Hand Productions, and Garden City Productions. Then he became a professional musical theater actor at the age of 10 and traveled to Halifax to play Michael in Neptune Theater's production of Mary Poppins. He currently is a student at Ann Meyer and is attending University of Ottawa next year. Welcome Aiden Ty to sing our national anthem. Whenever you're ready. Sure. Oh, Canada, our 
home and native land, true patriot love in all of us command. Car ton bras et porte les pères, il sait porter la croix. Ton histoire est une épampée des plus brillants exploits. God keep our land, glorious and free. O oh, Canada, we stand on guard for thee. O oh, Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Aiden, that was so well done. Thank on you. behalf of the city of Niagara Falls, I'd like to thank you for doing such a terrific job, making us proud to be Canadians. Thank well you very done. much. Just one thing, yep. I'd also like to say Aiden was a huge part in our Katie Campbell Memorial Benefit the last time, and he was one of our major singers, and he was fantastic. Very talented. Thank you, Thanks, Caroline. Aiden. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, everybody. Thank Please be safe. So in honor of National Poetry Month, we call upon Councillor Wayne Campbell, who's going to recite a poem on behalf of Deb Nansen and David Smith to present a poem. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, Deb Nansen couldn't be here tonight. She is in the hospital. Um, hopefully she's uh, receiving a liver right now. Uh, and as a way of introducing uh, the poem, Deb wrote, as a child, I would listen to the stories of grandfather's life, his respect for Niagara, his love for being a daredevil, his love for a city whose beauty makes her the seventh wonder of the world. I am his granddaughter, and my childhood dream was to be another Lucier to conquer Niagara. Walking with grandfather, Breathing in anything to do with Niagara as a child was the highlight I cherish most. Remembering the day, July 4th, 1928, when Joseph Albert Lucier became a daredevil by conquering this lady called Niagara. The ball of orange with steel strapping covered in rubber the dream of a young Frenchman. To pursue it is to challenge this lady called Niagara. Water over rock, a thunderous roar. The power to claim a life. His ball was built. The date and time set, July 4th, 1928, over he goes. 53 seconds in all to conquer Lady Niagara in the eddy he stayed, until pulled ashore by the Hill family. From the ball he emerged, the crowd roared. Lucier had defeated the Lady Niagara, who commanded respect in every sense. His ball battered along with a few dents. Later in life he married his children in awe of the story he told. Anyone who would listen would listen to the day Jean Lucier conquered the falls, this lady called Niagara. Grandfather would respect her, for this beauty can take your life. Breathe in the beauty, be awe of the power, water greenish blue. In awestruck of the beauty, a maiden sacrificed, so legend says, the form to form the rock of a horseshoe falls. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up uh, to read the next poem is David Smith. Uh, come to the mic, David.
Your Worship, Councillors, City of Niagara Falls. I've been asked to question on why I write and specifically why I write poetry. And this is what I think. Poetry writing, to acknowledge how we feel, that is the joy as our thoughts become real. To be in tune with the feeling, capture the moment on the spot, that's more important than all the logic we got. How we feel is more important than what we do. That rainbow of color, let the emotion shine through. Anger is released and love is exposed. Feelings of hope and enthusiasm grows. So let out the feeling and document the why. With the flick of the pen, the feelings we try. Acknowledge the emotion of why we're afraid. Changing our thought patterns, we will have it made. Know thyself through emotions that hit. Find the trigger and how to deal with it. Upfront and personal to get emotion written down or highly motivational to spread the optimism all around. Pick up a pen and let words flow like a river. Think of the emotion and let our knees quiver. A river with emotion over rapids we flow, then the tranquility, the security below. Be in control and let thoughts capture life. Thinking success, we can overcome strife. Think of the falls as hearts tumble in love. The beautiful feeling as that current starts to shove down to the ocean and fills the deep sea. A poet's paradise, the acknowledgement for me. Circumstances are temporary and situations change. Explore the rainbow and feel the emotional range. That's why we write to let tears hit the page, to laugh and to cry and get emotion engaged. The rainbow of feeling, a bridge we can bond to communicate to others in words and in song. Poetry writing and let all feelings fly. That's to have lived the courage to try. Well done. Well done, Dave. Yeah, I'm not sure. Well, can we take a vote? How many people thought the first poem had a little more oomph for the second poem? <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Dave, thanks so much. And for those of you that don't know, Dave is one of our commissioners as well uh, for a number of years. And on the side, he writes poetry. And uh, I know Stephen, uh, one of the other commissioners, brought it to our attention. And what a way to help celebrate Poetry Month in Niagara Falls with having such a great homegrown poet. Thanks very much, Dave. Thank you. Okay, Council, we're looking for an adoption of the minutes from April the 9th, 2019, moved by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? That's approved. Uh, disclosures of a peculiar interest. We're looking for disclosures. Councillor Lococo, then Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Check number 425058, March 14th, 2019, for $2,082.94, payable to myself. Check number 425714, April 3rd, 2019, $105.17, payable to myself. Check number 425288, March 20th, 2019, for 24,866.67, dollars payable to Project Share. I sit on the board as a, a, a resident. And check number 425519, March 27th, 2019, for $160.50, payable to Project Share. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Thompson. <laughs> Okay, Councillor uh, Strange, Peter yeah. Angel, and Campbell. Yes, Your Worship. Uh, check number 42577 and 425308, payable to myself. Okay, Councillor Peter Angel. Thanks, Your Worship. I have a few made out to my employer, Niagara Catholic uh, District School Board, 00211-0004. 00207-0003-00211-0005. I also have one made out to myself, same as Councillor Thompson, the uh, refund for the election filing, it's 425751. And then under reports, Your Worship, I have one conflict. Um, it deals with, uh, because I have a rental property and they're looking at making changes to um, 
uh, the water billing for tenants. So it would be under Report F 2019-14, and it would be attachments one, two, three, and eight. Did you get all that, Mr. Clark? Yeah. Oh, written down, yeah. Okay, good, good for that. Councilor Campbell. Thank you, Your Worship. I have a uh, conflict on check number 424999. It's made payable to myself. Thank you for that. Councilor Iannone. Thank you. I have two conflicts, check 425045 and 425702. One is the refunds for the $100 for the campaign, and the other is refund for airfare for FCM. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, if there's no other conflicts, I've got three checks to myself, 425398, 425193, <coughs> and 425 X, 8, 861 rather, made out to myself. Well, Mr. Clerk, thank you for that. Okay, move on to Mayor's reports and announcements. Uh, first off, we start with obituaries. Uh, John A. McIntyre, the father of Rachel Thorne, who works in our transit department, passed away. And Jane Rutherford, mother-in-law of Nick Pietrangelo of our transportation department. So our sympathies go out to them and to their families. Announcements, uh, KO for Kids for Cancer. I want to congratulate Mike Strange, our counselor here, on his annual charitable event. I was there sitting ringside uh, along with a number of other people and I got to say it was outstanding, well run, very professional was another successful fundraiser that sold out. Is there anything you'd like to maybe say about it, Councillor? I'd uh, just like to, uh, special thanks to Councillor Thompson and Councillor Dabrowski who sit on our committee for the Care for Kids. Uh, it was a, a great event, the first time we, we sold out. So it was amazing, we had uh, 21 matches. It was uh, pretty insane and um, we kind of started the night off with uh, ringing of the uh, can cancer free bell and uh, our Mayor walked in our, uh, our little uh, uh, teenage or eight year old uh, Brookie who came in and uh, what a sweetheart, she's been cancer free for three years. So we're, we're still waiting them out, but it looks like last year we raised over 67,000. It looks like we raised over $100,000 wow. this year for Ron McDonald House. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Just amazing, real professional. And next year, get your tickets early if you want to go and watch a real. And it's not just about boxing; it's entertaining. And uh, I don't know, how, would you say half the ma a third of the matches were were ladies? Yeah, we had, uh, eight women matches. So eight out of twenty-one. Yeah. So yeah. we always probably. try to get Wayne Thomas to the match, but no one uh, will out there with boxing. So I'm hoping <laughs> next year. So if they, anyone wants to step up. And, we have to be within 10 years, so that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so moving along, uh, Arbor Day, we'd like to thank all the volunteers who are planting trees and the sponsors. Special thanks to Mike Strange, who is the MC for the event in Chippewa this year. Upcoming events, we've got the Community Clean Sweep, which will take place Saturday, May the 11th, from 9 a.m. at Mick and Angelo's, where we go around with garbage bags, and we pick up trash around the city. Volunteers and groups are welcome to sign in. Just go on the city's website at niagarafalls.ca, and that would be forward slash clean sweep, and we can get you registered for the event. And for kids that need volunteer hours in high school, it's a great opportunity to do that as well. The soup kitchen, for that's the Niagara Falls Community Outreach right here in downtown. They're having their volunteer appreciation event at the Gale Center. That'll be taking place on Wednesday, May the 22nd from 9.30 until 11. So uh, maybe as well, uh, we can get that uh, put on the website to uh, get that message out. Uh, could I get a motion of council to actually get that out of the website? Councilor Cario and second by Councilor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? Okay, thank you for that. Only thing they didn't put here was, was this AM or is this PM? <laughs> And it doesn't say, so it's going to be 9.30 to 11, so take your chance, see what happens at the Gale Center, May 22nd. I'd like to thank Councilor Dabrowski for representing the city at the <coughs> grand opening of the Healing Salt Cave, and also at the certificate presentation to Mary Warren, 50-year employee at Falls Pharmacy, and to Councilor Strange for representing the city at the Ontario Municipal Human Resources Association's annual spring conference for bringing greetings and also to the Volunteer Firefighter Recognition Banquet, bringing greetings. And as well to Councilor Peter Angel representing the city on Sunday at the National Day of Mourning. Our next council meeting will be Tuesday, May the 14th. So we'll see you right back here. So moving along, so item. Just a quick one. Yes. I have that same $100 refund check. 
4284, never having gotten a check before, I didn't look for one. Okay, so we've got that. Okay, moving along to item 6.2, uh, Literacy Link Niagara. Uh, is Gay Douglas here? Gay Douglas? Uh, I don't know, maybe. It may not be here. Want to come back to that one? Yeah, we might have to, I think. Okay. Well, maybe if we can keep an eye open for, uh, for Gay. Item 6.3, the Niagara Lymphoma Awareness. We've got <coughs> Tiffany Aiello here and company with the bright green shirts. So we'll welcome her to the podium. She's going to talk to us a little bit about lymphoma. Mr. May, oh, sorry. <laughs> How do we advance the slides? Just the arrow button, Madam Clerk? Yeah, you can use the arrow there. Okay, thank you. Or the, or the mouse at the podium. Okay. Mayor Diodati and members of council. My name is Tiffany. I'm here with me today. I have a board member, Stephen Passero. Thank you for the opportunity to address you once again. When I was here last year, I had just been diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and had actively been seek, uh, working to educate the community about this disease and that I knew little about before being told that I had had it. My presentation was about wanting to have Niagara Falls recognize World Lymphoma Awareness Day, including the illumination of the falls, and that's why I'm here again this evening. My prognosis remains the same. There is no cure for the type of lymphoma that I have. The best that, I, the best that can be done is the treatment of symptoms and management of my pain. However, I refuse to let this illness dictate the life that I have left. And I want others to know that even through, even, the, even through isolation, even though isolation starts to set in, nobody should have to fight alone. I am committed to raising awareness about lymphoma and assisting others who are in the same circumstances as I am, a young adult still trying to raise their family. Lots of difficult decisions have to be made. Leaving the workforce to pursue treatments leaves you financially strained, and trying to still be the mom that your kids deserve is almost an impossible task. As a mom, it's my job. <laughs> to take care of my kids. But during treatments, and when I'm experiencing symptoms, it's usually them having to take care of me. <clears throat> My friends and family have been very supportive <coughs> as I have used this period of my life to take a bad situation and try to create something positive. This past September we had our very successful illumination of the falls which attracted dozens of people from around southern Ontario and western New York. Some drove more than six hours to be with us. In January, I formed, or I should say we formed, a nonprofit organization, Team Niagara Lymphoma Awareness and Assistance. And our objectives are providing financial assistance to individuals undergoing treatment for lymphoma. Providing, or sorry, facilitating involvement in social activities for these individuals and their families, promoting and participating in events and opportunities for community awareness. I would like to thank my fellow board members, Chrissy Schramm, Michelle Lennox, Jane Kelty, and Stephen Passero. It has been a roller coaster ride so far, but thanks to them and many more supporters, a few of which took the time to be here tonight. It has been well worth it. We are creating merchandise to, generating, uh, to generate funds, featuring our Team Niagara Lymphoma logo and also featuring someone else we'd like to introduce to you. This is our mascot, Leonard the Lymphoma Lizard. Now, Leonard does much more than just look great on coffee mugs and hats and shirts. 
Leonard is featured in our brand new coloring information booklet that we are rolling out in the weeks ahead. It's been designed to educate kids and families on lymphoma. We call it the Know Your Nodes campaign, educating people about their lymph nodes and their lymphatic system. Knowledge and early detection leads to additional options for treatment. Even though lymphoma is the leading diagnosed cancer in young adults, and in Canada the fifth most diagnosed cancer overall, it really hasn't grabbed national attention in the way that others have. Maybe because it doesn't actually have the word cancer in its name, but it is cancer, cancer of the lymphatic system. And lymphoma, unfortunately, is on a steady rise, averaging an additional 9,000 new lymphoma cases in Canada every year. There are now approximately 43,000 Canadians who are living with or in remission with lymphoma. We will continue our pursuit of awareness and continue to raise funds so that we may assist those who require assistance as they take the journey that I and others in this room have had. We would like to formally request that City Pro uh, Council proclaim September 13th 14th and 15th as Lymphoma Awareness Weekend in the City of Niagara Falls. We are working towards a formal launch party for our organization on the 13th, a full day of activities and promotions on the 14th, including a fundraising event at the Hose Brigade, and Sunday we will end the weekend by gathering at Table Rock House once again to watch the illumination of the falls in lime green, the signifying color of lymphoma. Upcoming events over the next couple of months include our team's participation in the Rankin Run on May 25th and a barbecue on June 22nd at the Zares on Morrison Street. You can check out Team Niagara Lymphoma on our Facebook page for more details. Thank you for your time this evening. There is always an open invitation for any members of council to join us at our upcoming events. We would be thrilled to have you. And we encourage the community to show their support as well. All you have to do is ask around and someone you are connected to more than likely has or knows someone who has been diagnosed with this disease. Team Niagara Lymphoma Awareness Assistance is here to stay and we hope the community joins us in our campaign to create awareness and provide assistance. Thank you very much, uh, Tiffany and Stephen. We appreciate, you know, you've been, quite through, been through quite the journey and it's great that you're drawing awareness and raising funds for something much needed. Well, we've got some questions, Councillor Campbell. No, not a question, Your Worship. Uh, I've kind of followed this young lady over the last little while, year, year and a half. I have to tell you, uh, she's one of the most uh, hardest working person that I've met and she's brought this, this organization to this point that it blows me away, it really does. I would make that motion, if you could, for, for September 14th and 15th. 13th, 14th, and 15th be a National Lymphoma Weekend. Okay, we've got a motion by Councillor Campbell, second by Councillor Dabrowski. We'll call the vote, all those in favor, and that's unanimously approved. So that will be the special weekend in Niagara Falls. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Clerk, for the arrangements as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, now we move on to our planning matters, 7.1. And I'd now ask our clerk if he'd be so kind as to introduce the next item on the agenda. Public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed amendment to the city zoning bylaw to permit a seven story mixed use building of 50 dwelling units and commercial floor space, a 12 story hotel and a 30 story apartment building at 5510 through to 5526 and 5536 Ferry Street, 5916 Allendale Avenue, and 5943 Stanley Avenue. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the Planning Act on March 14, 2019, and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who would like notice of the passing of the zoning bylaw amendment or would like to preserve their opportunity to appeal to the local planning appeal tribunal shall leave their name on the sign-in sheets that are located outside the council chamber. Okay, thank you very much. I now ask our director of planning, Mr. Hurlovich, to please explain the purpose and the reason for the proposed bylaw amendment. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. The uh, property in question is uh, comprised of five properties uh, altogether at basically the southwest corner of 
um, Ferry Street and Stanley Avenue. Uh, this slide on the screen depicts basically the surrounding land uses. So to the south of the property is a motel and some de single detached dwellings. <coughs> the, to the north are commercial properties. To the west is the hydro corridor and to the east are further commercial buildings. The, uh, this is a schematic of what the uh, corner of Stanley and Ferry would look like. Uh, the blank parcel in the front would be where the Dairy Queen is now. So uh, the building facing uh, Ferry Street is where Cupola Sports uh, Building is now. So that gives you some idea of what we're talking about. So the uh, proponent is um, proposing a 30-story apartment building facing onto Allendale, a seven-story mixed-use building, commercial and residential, uh, facing onto Ferry Street, and a 12-story hotel fronting onto Stanley Avenue. The uh, site plan for the property shows, again, those three buildings. So to the, the most uh, topmost uh, building is the seven-story mixed-use building. Uh, they are looking for some uh, uh, changes to the zoning requirements. So they're looking for a 5.4 meter side yard on the west side, a 2.3 meter side yard on the east side. Uh, the uh, building B, which is the building fronting on Stanley Avenue, that's the hotel proposal. They're looking at a 1.7 meter side yard on the north, a 14 meter side yard on the south, and a 1.7 meter uh, side yard or front yard on the east. And then the last building is that 30 story apartment building in the bottom left of the bit slide. And uh, they're looking for an 8.9 meter uh, front yard and a 7 point meter, uh, 5 meter interior side yard on the south. The report says north, but it should have read south. The um, applicant is uh, proposing to redevelop this uh, almost three acre uh, parcel of land composed of multiple properties. This property is currently zoned uh, tourist commercial, um, but they are looking for some zone changes. So in addition to the setbacks I just mentioned, they're also looking for uh, permission to have greater than 50% of the floor area in buildings A and C used for residential uh, dwelling units. And they're seeking an increase in height and uh, a reduction in parking spaces. The, uh, uh, the staff has reviewed this application. We found that the application does comply with provincial and regional policies. It satisfies the provincial uh, policies, which encourage a more efficient use of underdeveloped lands in the uh, city's uh, core, and it would help meet the city's intensification targets of 40%. The lands are designated tourist commercial in the Clifton Hills subdistrict, and that allows for a wide range of commercial and tourist related uses. The lands are also located within the Drummondville intensification node in the 30 story apartment building, seven story mixed use building will provide additional housing choices and comply with that <coughs> intensification policy. The developer is willing to enter into a section 37 agreement. Uh, this is a, uh, a contribution towards streetscapes um, should this application uh, be approved. The zoning amendment application is in conformity with our city's official plan. The proposal complies with the city's design guidelines by providing 25 meter separation distance between the 12 and 30 story uh, buildings. This is part of our uh, requirement to have gaps and to provide sky views. Uh, the existing infrastructure can support the proposed development. The applicant, as I said, is requesting a uh, modified um, tourist commercial zone, and the proposal is to allow more than 50% of the floor area to be used for dwelling units. So building A, that's the uh, building fronting onto uh, Ferry Street, the seven-story building, there will be 50 dwelling units. That comprises about 84% of the building. Uh, building C, that's the 30-story uh, apartment building, and that would be 100% um, excuse me, uh, residential. There are 300 dwelling units proposed in that building. They're also looking for increased height uh, from 12 meters, which is the current uh, standard in all of our TC zones. Uh, building A would have a height of 26.8 meters. Building B, that's the hotel fronting on Stanley, would have a height of 42.7 meters. 
and uh, building C would have a height of 38.6 meters, that's 30 stories. <coughs> uh, I should have pointed out that this is in a uh, 30 story height limit uh, <coughs> within our official plan. So the official plan does permit buildings to be as high as that through this zoning process. Uh, the applicant is looking for a reduction in uh, parking spaces. They will be providing for buildings A and C, so that's uh, the seven story um, building on Ferry Street, <coughs> excuse me, and the 30 story um, apartment building or condo building on Allendale of 490 uh, parking spaces. Building B, which is the hotel on Stanley, would have 610 spaces. There would be uh, 54 spaces altogether provided on the surface. The balance of the parking is provided in an underground parking structure. The uh, proposed regulations for each of the building, I actually outlined those earlier on the slide with respect to the interior side yard widths and the, uh, the front yard and that the uh, applicant is willing to enter into a section 37 agreement and the applicant has provided detailed landscape plans that would reflect the streetscape master plan as well as a letter of credit to uh, secure completion of those streetscaping features on Ferry Street, Stanley Avenue and Allendale. Uh, therefore, staff is recommending the council approve the zoning bylaw amendment application uh, to permit the construction of the three buildings. Building A, a seven-story mixed-use building. Building B, a 12-story hotel building. And building C, a 30-story apartment building. The uh, passage of the zoning bylaw will be conditional on the execution of the section 37 agreement for those three buildings, uh, which are the contributions to the streetscaping. <coughs> There would be a holding provision applied to the zoning that would require a geotechnical study be completed to the satisfaction uh, of uh, Ontario power generation. You may have read in the report, there are two tunnels under this section of the city to uh, feed the reservoir at the north end. The uh, council is also, um, <coughs> is also recommended council approve a request to uh, pass a deeming bylaw so that the uh, lots that uh, are combined to form this parcel would all be merged and uh, that would be placed on the same council agenda as the zoning bylaw at a later date. <coughs> and those are the highlights of this application. Thank you, Mr. Hurlovich. Do we have any questions of council for Mr. Hurlovich? Okay, seeing none, members of the public are advised that fa failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting will result in the local planning appeal tribunal dismissing any referral that it receives. Fail failure to sign the sign-in sheet will result in staff rejecting an appeal as per section 3419 of the Planning Act. Council will now hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak to this proposed bylaw amendment. So anyone here other than the applicant? Yes, you can come forward to the microphone. You could state your name and your address, please. Good evening, Mayor Diodati and members of City Council. My name is uh, John Strangis. I represent uh, 5550 Ferry Street, the one-story building that corners Allendale Road <coughs> adjacent to the, to the proposed building A, uh, the seven-story building. So we're on the corner lot there. I have a few concerns I'd like to address regarding parking, proposed height changes, and how it will, how it will affect 5550 Ferry Street. I am afraid the seven-story proposed building and the other two towers proposed height increase will overpower 5550 Ferry Street as it is only a single-story building, making it look out of place. The lack of parking space on the proposed property may cause illegal parking in the surrounding neighborhoods. Lots. Uh, another concern is the seven-story building A increases the existing regulation of 12 meters in height to a proposed 26 meters which will impact two existing billboard signs that are on 5550 Ferry Street, which is a source of income. One will definitely, definitely be blocked behind the building facing the development and the second rooftop sign facing Stanley Ferry will not be visible until you're almost in front of the building. This definitely <coughs> will eliminate one sign or possibly two facing westerly. Page nine, paragraph two of the planning report states, if an applicant exercises their current zoning rights and constructs a 12 meter high building, the existing billboards on the abutting Western Link property would be noticeably obstructed. I understand that. 
but if we increase the building height higher than the 12 meters, this will further impact the rooftop sign view. I'm hoping City Council can hold off on making a decision today until these concerns are addressed. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have any questions of council for Mr. Stranges? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else other than the applicant who wishes to address? Yes, Councilor uh, Kent. If I could, Mr. Strange. Mr. Strange, if you can come I, back. I apologize. Uh, in the report that we received, uh, it indicated that the developer was going to get in touch with you and uh, make some arrangements. Has the developer got in touch with you yet? I left uh, on the, the March 28th uh, open house meeting. I left them on my uh, phone number, my cell number. I uh, attempted to call him on Friday of uh, last Friday, and Monday he did call me, and there's no, there is no. Uh, no resolution. No resolution. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Is there anyone else other than the applicant who wishes to address council? Yes. You can state your name and your address, please. Mayor Jim Diodati, members of council. My name is Christopher Horton. I live at 5755 Pier Street. Um, I'm just asking in general respect to you and the council to uh, to approve the development. As everyone can see, uh, Cupolo Sports is an eyesore. Um, it's been there for many, many years. Uh, as you know, in my neighborhood, we had an arson fire this coming year. Um, Nothing was said about it. Um, I don't know what was done. I don't know what investigation was done. Um, I would just like to see a development there um, to approve this area. Um, we are, I do live in the south end. Um, our hub has been fixed. The market's gonna be fixed up. Our sidewalks in my area are gonna be fixed up. I would just like to see something there, uh, not like an eyesore building that we have with graffiti. And uh, you know, people are, I could say they're very upset in the neighborhood because this building is sitting there doing nothing. Um, so whatever can be done, I would ask you please to approve it or fix it up in general. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much, Mr. Horton. Is there anyone else other than the applicant? Yes? So if there's anyone other than the applicant who wishes to address council, you can just state your name and your address, please. <coughs> Yes, my name is Greg Chapman. Uh, I represent the ownership for 5500 Ferry Street, which is also known as uh, the Dairy Queen. I spoke with your uh, staff, uh, for the planning staff, <coughs> sorry, at length within the past week, uh, and we discussed some of the issues that were outstanding. Uh, they've done an excellent job of addressing the majority of those issues. So as the ownership, and we've owned that property for about 50 years, both the Chapmans and the Hajinakas's, um, we feel as though uh, it should go ahead. We have had conversations with the ownership uh, in the last uh, few weeks about some of the construction issues that we may have, but we are entirely satisfied today. That's great, thank you. Thank you, any questions of council? Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chapman. Is there anyone else here other than the applicant who wishes to address council on this matter? Okay, seeing none, council will now hear from the applicant or his or her representative. Welcome. Good evening, Your Worship, members of council. I appear on behalf of the applicant. With me this evening is the owner of the, of the property, uh, Paolo Fugel. I can have him stand up, please. Uh, he intends to develop the property with his investment group and proposes to build out the project as soon as all approvals are received. My understanding is as soon as this approval is received, he's ready to proceed with site plan approval. Also with me is Michael Allen, the owner's project architect. And we also have the uh, traffic consultant, Jeff Sluggett. And that is the team. Um, before Michael begins his presentation, I wanted to make some introductory remarks. Um, as you've heard, the proposed development will include 350 dwelling units and an additional 150 hotel rooms. My client has engaged an international hospitality consulting firm, which has received four proposals from major international hotel fr franchises in relation to the hotel, 
all of which propose hotel brands not currently in the Niagara Falls market. They are all very, very interested in this property. In relation to the condo units, when fully built out, there will be 350 families living on this site. I submit to you that this is truly a game changer for this area of the city and what is known as the Drummondville node in your official plan. Your official plan policies promote residential intensification to improve the vitality of the existing commercial areas, in this case, the existing restaurants, bakeries, food stores, existing retail stores, existing Falls View Casino, and entertainment and other amenities. This development does exactly that. It brings 350 families within walking distance of all these businesses year round, not to mention the guests of the hotel. There are catchphrases that planners, architects, and lawyers often use, and I'm sure you've heard many times in this room on planning meetings. Uh, complete communities, smart growth, places where you can live, work, and play, compatible infill residential intensification. I submit to you this development satisfies, satisfies all these catchphrases and policies. Here residents will be able to walk or take transit right outside their front door to thousands of jobs in the tourism sector and beyond, to shopping and amenities, and parks and recreation amenities nearby. You will not need a car to live, work, and play from the site. Furthermore, the highlight of this proposal is that it is not a high-density infill project next to an existing, long-standing residential neighborhood. The fact that we have no residents here to um, speak against this confirms that this is a great spot for high density residential intensification. The usual issues of compatibility between existing low density residential developments and new higher density infill development simply does not exist here. Now, if I can address uh, the comments from Mr. Stranges. Um, who I understand owns the commercial one-story building that I believe operates as a uh, leased pizza business. Um, it's well established. Um, you have your lawyer here, you have your planner here. There's case law that well establishes there's no right to a view. If there was, you wouldn't have the hotels you have in the Falls View, simply put. He mentions that uh, impact on his billboard signs, once again, uh, billboard signs are licensed by the city. It's not an outright right that everyone has to put a billboard on their property. And you do it subject to the overwhelming right of, you have no right to a view. You have no right to what your neighbor can do on their property as long as they meet all the city's planning policies, which I submit we do. If I can leave you with some uh, numbers in terms of the financial implication of this development. The total construction cost is estimated to be well over $150 million. The total development charges payable will be approximately $6.3 million. Property taxes are estimated at about $2.1 million annually for the condo sites and approximately 600,000 annually for the hotel. I think that's a bit low. For a total of about 2.7 million annually. As well, as part of this, you're going to uh, receive parkland dedication fees, which we're not sure how much that is right now, as well as section 37 bonusing payments. Um, in relation to the recommendation report, we fully endorse uh, planning staff's recommendations. Uh, the only issue I wanted to address was the uh, the mention of a H being put on the zoning until the geotechnical report is completed. You'll see that part of the recommendation is that the zoning be conditional on a section 37 bonusing agreement. I'd suggest to you that that can also be dealt with as a condition of the zoning rather than putting an H on the zoning. Putting an H on the zoning means we have to come back to you to lift the H I, so, I see no reason why we need to do that. You've already put a condition for a Section 37 bonusing agreement. 
we can't uh, get a permit until that's done, just like we can't get a permit until a geotechnical report is completed. So it just, we'd appreciate if that could be simply made a condition as opposed to an H being put on the zoning in that respect. Um, I appreciate the comments of Mr. Horton and Mr. Chapman. Um, I think it's quite clear that this is really going to improve the area. Um, Mr. Stranges has concerns about the value of his property if the billboards um, cannot be seen. I would submit to you that the value of his property is going to increase substantially if this development proceeds in his backyard. Those are my comments. If I could ask Mr. Allen to Just before you approach. run away, Mr. Beck, I just want to ask uh, Mr. Ilovich if he could comment on the request regarding the H uh, versus, as a condition versus on the zoning. So Mr. Ilovich, if you could maybe just weigh in on this for us. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'm, uh, I'm not exactly sure. Hydro has asked for the, uh, the geotechnical studies and our building department would probably be looking for the same thing. I'm not sure that what the real impact is. The tunnels are a couple hundred feet uh, beneath this, so I'm not sure that there is an exact uh, impact, um, so they won't get their building permit, as was stated, without that geotechnical work. So that's, uh, I suppose, the uh, the protection uh, on this rather than uh, holding that up. I'm not sure that a holding provision is a big obstacle because basically uh, we bring a council a report to council, say let's lift the H. We have the bylaw at the same meeting, um, and uh, the notice is sent out after the bylaw is passed. There's no public meeting for the lifting of an H. So I'm not sure that's the hardship as Mr. Baca describes, um, but I think there are enough protections that they're not going to get their building permit without that geotechnical study. Okay, okay. do you want to bring up uh, Mr. <coughs> Arnold? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Were there any questions for Mr. Baca? I'm sorry, of council before he runs away? No? Okay, thank you. Mr. Allen, welcome. Good evening, Your Worship, <laughs> members of council and staff. I would like to start off firstly by thanking Mr. Hurlovich and the uh, planning staff for all of their hard work and collaboration with us on this uh, application. There was a lot of work and effort put into this, uh, this application. So the proposed site, as everyone's talked about, uh, being the, the former cupolos, um, this site is, we feel, a very integral and very important site to this part of the city. Um, it's an amalgamation of a few properties. Uh, firstly, it is the, if you recall, the former Impala Motel, which had access on Allendale as well as um, Stanley Avenue. It is as well the uh, Cupolo's um, Sporting Center, which has the direct access to um, Ferry Street. We feel this is extremely important because Stanley, the Stanley and Ferry intersection is a very significant gateway to the existing tourist and commercial core to the city. And we believe our development will reinforce that. In this illustration, it also shows you the subject site and then going south on Stanley Avenue, the progression of the hotels and the development along the tourist core where the um, developments range from 18 stories up to 56 stories. Just wanted to show you some existing photographs so everyone's familiar with the site. As part of our development, you're going to see that our development is really enticing a design to redefine the streetscape of Stanley and Ferry Street. The site right now, as well as that entire intersection, is very underutilized and very underdesigned. So as it was previously stated, our proposed development is a combination of three buildings. The first building being the seven-story building fronting on Ferry Street. That will be a mixed-use commercial with access along the main street with 50 condominium units, condominium units above. The second building proposed to be a 12-story, 150-unit hotel. That's with direct access at Stanley Avenue, as well as the, the access point from the, um, the drive access into the site. And the third building, which will have predominant views and access along Allendale, is the 30-story, 300 condominium building. As Mr. Hurlovich noted in his report, the subject lands are designated tourist commercial in the city's official plan. But they're also located within the Clifton Hill subdistrict area, which permits the commercial and tourist uses as we're proposing in our development. 
But furthermore to that, the subject lands are also located in the Drummondville intensification area, which identifies the residential intensification for the density as well as the height that we're proposing in our development. Now the three principal components of our application um, is to amend the existing tourist commercial zone to be site specific. The principal one is to permit more than 50% floor area to be utilized for residential uses in building A and building C of our development. The second major component of the amendment is for the building height to be increased to 30 stories, so ranging from 7, 12, to 30. And the other one is a reduction in the parking requirements of the standard bylaw. Now as part of our application to the city, we ultimately had to submit several reports. First and foremost, we did submit a traffic impact study as part of our application. It was prepared by Associate Engineering and Mr. Jeff Saget, the principal engineer working on that, is here this evening to address any comments and questions that you may have with regards to the report. But I would like to note that the city staff as well as the regional transportation services vetted our report and have approved it. An archeological study and report was conducted on the site as its location to the historical Drummondville area and can say that the site is clear of any archeological matters. A phase one and a phase two environmental report was also done on this site and the site is a clean site and notably we have already applied for the record of site condition as moving the development forward. A noise and wind study was also conducted as part of the height strategy criteria for the 30 stories. And I will note as I'm going through my presentation, the site design, location, and orientation of the buildings as well as the, as well as the design of the buildings were done specifically to mitigate any issues that were brought up in those reports. We also conducted a market analysis report on the property. And in the Coles Notes version, the market analysis came back with a favorable recommendation for the residential intensification for this area and specifically for this site. And finally, for another note, um, to one of the gentlemen's comments this evening, uh, a demolition permit has been applied for so that we can remove the derelict cupola building from the site. So I would like to just explain a little bit of the site design itself and, the, and how it came to be. So first and foremost, the access to the site was very important. We wanted to maintain access along Stanley Avenue as a principal access. As part of the traffic study, we kept it as far south from the existing intersec intersection to minimize any impact with it. We also wanted to maintain principal access along Allendale. You'll notice that we have no access along Ferry Street because that's part of the pedestrian and street scale that we wanted to create for the design. The landscaping design, although in concept phase and we've been into site plan agreement, will ultimately get into a lot more detail. But as you can see in the illustration, the intent of the design was first and foremost to work in collaboration with the city and the region to integrate our landscape design with that of the master plan streetscape, tying in the street trees, the walkways, the pedestrian colonnades, and so forth. One of the other criteria is to actually create a streetscape along Allendale. As you saw from the pictures that we showed, there is no streetscape along Allendale. And with the, the condominium development, we will create a definition and a presence there. Everything else is maintained internal. The idea was to maintain the parking within the courtyard concept so that there are no vehicles and cars along the principal road of St Stanley and Ferry Street. The buildings themselves have been strategically designed and sited. The intent of the design was first and foremost to define a connection between the public realm, the commercial node, and that of the, pro the, the private realm. The whole intent of the design was to define and redefine the actual streetscapes <coughs> along Stanley and Ferry Street. This is being created by encouraging pedestrian circulation. It's being encouraged by stepping the buildings, which allows us to create a scale at the building. It's encouraged by creating terraces and rooftop amenities. What that does, it allows us to animate the site, animate the development, so that we're not just looking at brick, glass, mortar, and vehicles going by in the principal streets. You can actually see the site alive. The 30-story tower, in which we defied all urban design principles, because the principles are is to put those towers right at the intersection corner. But in this design, we felt it prudent to be internal to the site. And we did that specifically, A, to mitigate wind issues, 
and things of that nature, but it also allows us to define the massing of the site with the visual impacts to the site and from the site. This is an almost real life illustration of what the development will look like. So as you can see on our illustrations, they're just not 12 stories, seven stories or 30 stories. We are tiering these buildings, we're stepping these buildings to create scale, balconies, rooftop terraces and so forth. So it allows a, a nice interaction and not just big block, block buildings. So the proposed development, as it's already been noted, because Rocky took a lot of the catchphrases, but I am gonna repeat them. The proposed development of the mixed use retail, commercial, tourist and residential intensification is consistent with the provincial, regional and city objectives for the intensification within an existing urban built up area. The development itself will pr promote the efficient use of existing infrastructure and services within that core area. <coughs> It will, without a doubt, promote economic growth, employment growth, and population growth. And by definition, this will be the true live, work, and play model for this sector of the city. So in closing, the proposed development is consistent with provincial and regional smart growth policies. It is consistent with the city's zoning and official plan policies, which are all supporting the intensification, the density, and the increased building height. And as we have presented to you this evening, the proposed development will reinforce this major intersection as one of, if not the key gateway to the city's already existing bustling tourist and commercial core. The combination of the mixed use in conjunction with the residential intensification will reinforce and define the existing built up urban area of Niagara Falls. So with that, I would like to thank you for your time, your consideration and I would open up to any questions or comments. Any questions of council for Mr. Allen? Mr. Mayor, before we close the uh, public meeting, uh, Mr. Pingu, Felix Pingu came a little late. He wanted to speak to the matter in support of the application. He owns the Napoli Pizzeria directly across the street and uh, he wants to speak in favor of it. Sure. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Worship, member of the council, citizen. Thank you to allow me to speak. I hear about this project. I did not meet the owners yet, but uh, he introduced himself to my son. Soon he purchased the property, and my son thought very highly of the gentleman. I don't know where he's here yet, but I uh, followed up with the project. He's a neighbor and citizen of Niagara. I support the project. It's it's something that we need in that area there. And uh, I'm, f I'm on a process that to uh, renovate uh, Napoli also. Uh, we purchased a property next door. So then uh, I think we'll fit this that area. It's a central on Niagara. And I think with this project will help the community, the jobs and of course, jobs not only to build, but the future. I have my su support, and I hope the city council will support this project for benefit on Niagara. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful development. It's beautiful. It's got so many points of interest, and uh, putting thousands of people in that area is going to benefit all the businesses around it. It's going to fill those. It'll be a very positive, in my opinion. Councilor Coco. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. It's a great opportunity for our community. I think a lot of thought has gone into all of these. Obviously, you've had some discussions with Dairy Queen about some of their concerns, and I understand that we're, no one is um, allowed the right to a view, and I was just wondering if there is any changes that can be made to satisfy Mr. Strange's concerns about his billboard. I, I do support the project, but I would just like to bring that up. <coughs> Mr. Allen? So through your worship, and thank you for your comment. Um, I mean, it's certainly as neighbors, we would want to sit and discuss and see how we can mitigate um, impacting <coughs> their development and the billboard. 
I do know that my client did speak with him yesterday and there were some discussions and without getting into a lot of detail, there was monetary discussions going back and forth. I think it's something they're gonna have to spend some time discussing. Um, as you can see from the illustration, the billboards that are in question, it's certainly the one that is facing northeast East. that I believe um, the gentleman is concerned with. Mr. Vaca is right that there is no right of view. Um, saying that even if we stuck within the existing bylaws of a four-story building, that in itself would also block the views of, of the site. Now saying that, I mean, business is business. We certainly don't want anyone to suffer from it. Um, and if the gentleman continues to run his pizza pizza joint from there, I mean, having 350 condo people living behind there, I think will certainly help in, in that business aspect. But all I can say is that we are willing to sit and discuss more with him. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Allen. If there are no further questions of council, this public meeting with respect to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is now concluded. Councillor Thompson. Thank you. Yes, uh, I have to tell you that I'm extremely impressed with uh, the total thought and development that is being put forward here. Um, the, the underground parking, the way they put it together uh, is uh, phenomenal. And to take that piece of property that has been an eyesore for so many years, I think that uh, this is uh, a wonderful gift for this municipality. And uh, I think that Mr. Strange is, is going to find that uh, they're going to listen to him and uh, it's going to be a very positive thing for him also. So uh, it's a delight to uh, welcome the new owner to the city and uh, I'm happy to make the motion for approval for a great project. And on that motion, Councillor, did you want to address the oh, H provision? Uh, yeah, but take out the H. Okay. They have to deal with uh, OPG, so that gives them a time frame anyway. Okay, we've got a motion by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Strange. Is there any further discussion or debate of Council? Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved unanimously. So thank you very much. Congratulations and welcome to Niagara Falls. Okay, next up on the agenda, I would ask our fire chief if he would introduce the consultant who will make the next presentation. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to members of council, I, it's my pleasure to introduce Lyle Kwan. Um, Lyle is a retired fire chief from the Waterloo Fire Department and he works for emergency management and training and he's here tonight to make the presentation. Good, thank, thank you. you very much, Chief. Uh, good evening, your worship, members of council and staff. Uh, as the Chief says, my name is Lyle Kwan. I'm here on behalf of Emergency Management and Training. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to give you this high-level overview of the report that we have submitted. Uh, basically, uh, if I could just start off with uh, the, the focus of this project, uh, there was eight key areas that we looked at <coughs> that ranged from looking at uh, the present staffing, both full-time and volunteers, a number of stations, calls, responses, uh, geographical area and also comparative data analysis and when I say comparative data analysis I'm talking about uh, call volumes over the past several years uh, looking at other fire departments in uh, similar regions communities and, and their, their staffing and, and how they uh, they are supplying services to the community uh, so with looking at that uh, some of the overall questions we want to uh, consider of course was uh, what does a community of uh, comparative analysis reveal and and I, I would also like to say that uh, these are just generalities uh, being that uh, Niagara Falls is a is a unique community in its own just like uh, uh, Waterloo where I was fire chief is a unique community of its own uh, they have all their their own needs their own circumstances so the information that we gather uh, shouldn't be taken in silo uh, mentality uh, also look at what staffing would be required to staff a new fire station. Uh, one of the things that we were asked to look at was the possibility of a station, uh, station seven uh, within the community. Uh, and also 
how will this new fire station affect overall service? So again, looking at call volumes, looking at the call volumes in that community where the new station would probably be located. Um, uh, so we, we gathered uh, a lot of that data with the assistance of the fire chief and his staff. Uh, how does the present and future growth of the city affect all of this? So we were made aware that there is quite a bit of growth coming into the community. And um, uh, to be proactive and, and look at this and, and have a fire station uh, to be prepared to take care of uh, this growth and, and increasing call volume. Uh, also transient population. And that's uh, again where Niagara Falls is very unique. Looking at the millions of people that come into Niagara Falls uh, in the year. And uh, this also increases the call volume. So you don't have just a static population like some communities have. Uh, you have to take all that into consideration. So uh, with, uh, with all of that in mind, um, you know, some of the key sections within the report looked at the department and the community overview. So what is the department presently made up of? Where are the stations made up, are, are located? Uh, what, what is the community uh, like uh, in, in relation to not only residential, industrial, commercial, uh, also the transient population? Uh, response times are a key uh, factor to take into consideration. Uh, as uh, some of you may know, if, if, when you pick up that phone and dial 911, you need that service right away. Uh, not 10 minutes, uh, not 15 minutes, as soon as possible. Uh, the station location analysis. So we actually did two different styles of analysis. Uh, we utilized our own uh, 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 GIS information uh, and we also worked with the fire chief and uh, your GIS people to uh, create another set of uh, data and response, uh, almost street by street response, uh, which is also in this presentation. And then of course uh, some recommendations at the end of the day about uh, the staffing and uh, the station requirements. So based on a lot of this, uh, we refer to many standards that are out there. The National Fire Protection Association standards, which are seen as industry best practices. They are not legislated. Our council does not have to follow them. But being that they are industry standards and recognized throughout the world, um, it, it's, uh, they are, are uh, standards that uh, we felt had to be uh, noted in our report. Uh, the fire underwriters, uh, 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 review, uh, the Occupational Health and Safety Act, and, and of course many other standards, and also council approved policies and procedures. Uh, the last point there, the Commission on Fire Accreditation International, is an organization that has set a uh, voluntary uh, process for fire departments to become accredited based on looking at uh, the industry standards and best practices. And we also utilize this as a guideline. Now, the Ontario Fire Marshal's Office uh, promotes what they call three lines of defense, and we also looked at this uh, within our review. And when they talk about three lines of defense, the first line of defense is public education, public fire safety education. And within our report, we did make a recommendation in relation to this. Uh, the next line of defense is uh, code enforcement through inspections. And the final one is emergency response capabilities. Because no matter what happens, eventually, uh, unfortunately, uh, there, there may be that need for that emergency response to take care of a fire or uh, some other emergency situation. So uh, just going back to the response assessment, uh, response time station locations. Now, very few communities actually set an, a, a response time standard. However, that does not preclude the fire service uh, to look at their standards uh, over the years, how they're responding to calls, and if there's an increase in those times, why is there an increase? So these are some of the things that we looked at uh, based on the several years of data that the chief and his staff were able to give us. Uh, along with the, this, we looked at uh, the stations themselves, uh, look at, at uh, their response areas. and. Uh, as, as uh, we all know, as a community grows, there's challenges with traffic. So what might have been a three minute response 10 years ago is now maybe an eight minute response because of traffic, rush hour times, uh, the, hi the height of the, uh, the tour season. All of these things come into consideration when we look at 
the need for fire stations. So just a quick overview, just to give you an idea of some of the data that we looked at uh, from 2015 right up to 2018. Um, it's, it's really the bottom numbers uh, that are bolded. If you look at that, uh, so in 2015, the fire department overall responded to 5,550 calls. In 2018, it went up to 6,125 calls. So there is a, a continual increase of almost 9% every year that the fire department is responding to, which puts a real stress on the department itself. Uh, as as uh, your worship and council knows, uh, you have several stations, but only a few of them are full time. The rest are volunteer. And uh, so there's a great dependence on that, uh, that, that staffing uh, to get to a scene as, as quickly as possible. And with call volumes increasing, these are things that need to be taken into consideration. So based on our review, um, we looked at the population per firefighter ratio that is similar to a lot of the communities that we surveyed. Uh, and now also if you take into consideration that, uh, and, and uh, my numbers might be a little off, but uh, when we look at the annual um, tourist population, uh, it's approximately 12 million tourists that come to uh, Niagara Falls every year. So even if you added that in, uh, that, that really skews the numbers quite a bit. But when you look at the population itself, uh, we looked at uh, other communities that were similar and how many stations did they have, how much staffing did they have. Uh, we found that a lot of the similar communities had uh, a ratio that's comparative to uh, Niagara Falls at this time, that the staffing levels are also comparative uh, to other communities. Uh, and also looking at what we call front run vehicles. So uh, each station might have one or two vehicles that would be the first response vehicles. So how many are there uh, at each station compared to other communities? Now, um, it's, uh, unfortunately this uh, uh, map didn't come up as well as we had hoped. Uh, but if you look at it, uh, you can see where the fire stations, one, two, three, uh, all of them are and also where the proposed fire station is. And if you keep that in mind, the following maps that we're gonna show were uh, through the assistance of the fire chief and uh, GIS personnel uh, helped us to uh, drill down onto almost like a street by street response time and uh, what stations could cover certain areas within certain timelines. So, uh, again, uh, just looking at uh, focusing on the station and where all the dots are, they are the main clusters of calls. Uh, and uh, this is uh, real good information for us when we look at it. Uh, for example, if you look to the southern part of Niagara Falls, there's not a lot of dots. So if, if for example, the fire chief <coughs> was recommending that a uh, station be put at the south end, well, we would be uh, saying to them, well, there's not a lot of call volume to support that. However, in the Station 7 area, as you can see, there's a lot of clustering of calls in that area. There's approximately 800 to 1,000 calls a year just in that area. Uh, and what happens is when, uh, say, Fire Station 1, 2, or 3 are pulled into that area to respond to a call, it leaves that station, uh, station's area uh, without the coverage that it, it uh, would hopefully have uh, in need for a call of an emergency. To that point, yeah, excuse me one second, yeah. Mr. Kwan. To that point, <coughs> the cluster, the numbering of cluster, the cluster number that you have circled there, did you compare that now to what it was when we deferred the project in, I think it was three years ago? 2017, I believe it was. Um, uh, uh, has it changed very much? Uh, yes, there has been change. Now, uh, when I say that, uh, we worked with the fire chief on that and looking at the data. Now, this one is the most recent one. When I say recent, within the last year. We don't have the, the clustering from uh, three years past, but we did look at uh, call data in the last few years in that area. Okay. And it is increasing, yes. Oh yeah, I'm not surprised. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right, thank you. So when I say we, we looked at um, uh, the areas, um, and, and again, um, hopefully uh, uh, Council can see this uh, map on, on their screens a little bit better. Uh, here's uh, Station 1 itself, and uh, where you see the red area, 
Uh, that's basically where station one is. So within a minute or two, where it can respond to, within three to four minutes, where it can respond to. And um, the, uh, the area where station seven is, and I don't know if I can, uh, I can yeah, so station seven, where we're, we're talking about, uh, would be up and around this area. Uh, and as you can see, uh, a lot of the, uh, this station, a lot of the calls, timelines fall well outside of uh, what we would consider an industry best practice recommendation. Uh, when we look at, and uh, we're just looking at the full-time stations at this time. So when we look at station two, again, uh, where the, uh, the red area is, that's within one to two minutes, then it grows out to four to six to eight minutes. And when we look at station seven again, it falls way out into the eight or nine minute timelines. So again, uh, both those stations uh, could not get to that area within what we would see as an industry best practice recommendation. Uh, the next station, station three, uh, again, uh, this station uh, has, a, has a good coverage in its area, which is expected. So there was nothing new when we looked at some of this data. The, the stations themselves are very well situated within their communities. However, covering that area uh, of the uh, Station 7 area, it's again, uh, the timelines fall uh, outside of industry best practice recommendations. Now, when we finally move into uh, Station 7, with putting Station 7 into the area that we have uh, recommended, um, it, you can see that all of a sudden this area is now covered well within uh, four to five minutes. So that uh, what we'll call that kind of gap coverage from the other three full-time stations is now properly covered by the Station 7. So again, uh, the, the original area that was identified uh, years ago, we're, we're still supporting that. So now, uh, the recommendations, uh, and I'm gonna go over these again relatively quickly because council has that report. Uh, but the key focus of the recommendations uh, were on uh, fire prevention initiatives. As I say, that was the first line of defense that the Ontario Fire Marshals uh, recommends. Um, and also um, looking at the community risk assessment and then also the uh, Station 7 staffing. So the first one, and, and I'm not going to read every word here, uh, basically uh, we're, we're reaffirming that fire prevention is the least costliest way of providing loss control. It is the first line of defense. And uh, we've mentioned to the fire chief that he should really uh, emphasize uh, uh, you know, a program that will uh, promote public education and code enforcement throughout uh, the community. I'm sorry, did one of the counselors say? Oh. She had a question, just not yet. Oh, all right. Now, the risk assessment, uh, based on the anticipated growth in population inf infrastructure, and, and while well, even tonight we, we heard about a, a new possible uh, level of infrastructure coming into the community, um, we, we feel that uh, the location identified for Station 7, uh, which was uh, presented to us uh, uh, when we started the program, is well situated to meet the future needs. Uh, we are led to believe that there's gonna be a fair bit of, of intensification in that area, um, a new hospital in that area. So there's gonna be a lot of uh, stuff happening in that area that uh, really would support the need for a, a new station. Also, as I've already mentioned, that uh, within our review, there's at least uh, 800 calls or more that occur in that, that area every year. You do have a station that is uh, south of there, uh, Station 4, uh, which is um, a volunteer station. But the volunteer station could not handle that kind of call volume. So we weren't recommending anything about that. Um, it's also something that we, we recommend to the fire chief to keep an eye on that station because the call volumes for that station are increasing. And we have found that uh, over the years and all the studies that we've done, that generally when a, a station runs more than 400 calls a year, you start burning out your volunteers. So this is something that we've asked the fire chief to keep an eye on. Now, uh, the recommendation number three is station seven uh, staffing. Uh, of course, uh, we're recommending that the station be staffed 24 seven. 
um, and that uh, we did uh, provide a few different options. And within those options, uh, option number two is the one that we are recommending. However, having said that, uh, we would be remiss if we didn't give council several options here uh, because that's our job to ensure that you, you look at uh, what ways you can utilize your present staff, uh, look at future staffing increases uh, and uh, uh, similar situations like that. So the first option for the uh, station seven <coughs> would be replacing a rescue truck uh, with a pumper rescue um, at station one. Uh, uh, and this would uh, permit deployment of the pumper from station one over to station seven. That would leave two trucks at station one, which would be uh, the, the pumper rescue as we say. Uh, there would be no additional staffing required at this point. Now, Niagara Falls Fire Department is, is in somewhat of a unique situation that um, um, I didn't have in Waterloo where they have, and I don't want to use the term two extra firefighters. They, they have a complement that allows the, the movement of two firefighters to help cover for overtime, sick, uh, sick leave, whatever the case is. And because of that, um, your overtime budget is nowhere near as high as my overtime budget was in Waterloo, where I didn't have that availability of the, those two extra firefighters to move around. Nonetheless, you, you do have those two firefighters that could be utilized in some of the staffing situations. <coughs> so that's option number one. Uh, option number two is now you're taking those two uh, uh, firefighters and uh, assigning two to the aerial truck. Presently, your aerial is staffed by four. Um, uh, on, on any given day, there's four on that. Now, by doing that, you could move a pumper from station one and put it over to station five or station seven. Uh, so this could be done uh, without the hiring of additional firefighters. However, we're also recommending that you increase the numbers eventually to bring the staffing of the aerial back up to four minimum. Uh, there's many studies out there that have, have identified that uh, uh, four on a, on a vehicle is uh, the preferred method is, is one of the more efficient methods to, uh, to staff a vehicle. So that's the one that we are uh, recommending as our number one option. Option number three is uh, almost similar to uh, number two, or, uh, but uh, th in this one, uh, you move two firefighters from each platoon uh, to station seven without impacting normal minimum staffing at the other stations. So that's where you, you have those two extra personnel. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> this would result in station one having a fully staffed pumper rescue and aerial, as well as station seven being staffed with a minimum of four firefighters. <clears throat> now, when you take uh, those two firefighters and assign them to a vehicle, there could be that increase in overtime because now the, the fire chief and the department doesn't have the flexibility of utilizing those two personnel. So there could be, if you went with option three, there could be an increase in, in uh, overtime due to sickness or anything like that. And that would have to be monitored over time. And option number four is, is kind of where you just leave everything status quo and uh, at station seven, uh, you, you uh, get a, a, a new vehicle and you hire the staff that you need to staff that station fully, which would be 20 staff, which is uh, quite a cost to the, to the city. So there are some options there that you can move around with. Um, uh, the fire chief uh, and I have discussed these in, at length and, and he's, he's well, well versed in, in why we looked at uh, each of these options. So having said that, the overall assessment, uh, the Niagara Falls Fire Department is endeavoring to meet the needs of the growing community. They, they are doing an excellent job with the resources that they have. Uh, there's no doubt in our minds that there is a need for a new station uh, in the location that was identified to us. Uh, how it is staffed at the end of the day, I think this, this is greater discussion that uh, council and, and the fire chief need to have in the future. Uh, to find the most efficient and effective method uh, and the most cost effective method at this time. Uh, the incorporation of the noted recommendations found in this report 
we believe will help the uh, fire department meet the future goals and expectations of the community as it continues to grow. So uh, in conclusion, uh, there's always room for improvement. There's always uh, other options that may be discussed in the future. Uh, we feel that the, uh, the four basic options that we presented are the most reasonable options to look at. Uh, for the staffing of this uh, Station 7. Uh, we, we have no doubt uh, with all the people that we met within the department that they are dedicated and, and looking forward to continuing to serve the community to the best of their ability. And your worship and council, that ends my presentation. I wanna thank everyone for the opportunity for uh, myself and, and our organization, Emergency Management and Training, to be part of this uh, research review and present uh, our recommendations to you. Thank you, Mr. Kwan. Uh, Council, if you have any questions, I know Councilor Arnone does. Thank you. Um, I appreciate your, your report. Um, that is my background, emergency management, crisis communication, and crime prevention. So I, I, I found your report very interesting. And I'm gonna go out on a limb here and, and just say, our fire department was already doing fire prevention initiatives. They already, we already knew that that was um, a priority. Your number one priority is the safety and well-being of your residents, and, and we were doing that. Um, your risk assessment isn't in this. I was looking for a HIRA or a risk assessment. Is your risk assessment a separate document? Uh, no, no, we uh, we didn't include a risk assessment. We looked at, when I say risk assessment. It says we results of community risk assessment. Yeah, we, we looked at uh, what the uh, fire chief had presented to us and based on his information uh, and the risk assessment that was conducted by the fire department. Uh, that's where we came to some of these conclusions. Okay, so I'll move on to, station, to staffing. Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the chief. When I spoke to, I called the chief today and I asked two questions. I asked if there was a high rep because I was looking for it. And this, the chief said to me that this was not a needs analysis that there was never a discussion as to whether that's where the fire station should be or if we needed it. It was a staffing analysis. So my question to the chief is, and I asked it before, how did we get to $7.5 million now to build it? Because my understanding is that everything short of the, the wages of our staff are covered by development charges or are recoverable by development charges. I asked the question last time, who came up with the $7.5 million number? And Mr. Todd <coughs> said, a consultant, the experts. I asked the chief and it was, it was actually Hemson, a development charge study group who is presenting next, who came up with the $7.5 million number. I don't, I don't think that's an expert on building fire stations. But I'm wondering how we got to 7.5 million. Because if we knew in 20, 2017, which was January, we were doing our budget deliberations, it's the same space, it's in the same place. We need it. The fire department told us that. We had two reports before that that told us we needed it. It seems to me we've cost ourselves $3 million by, our, by getting a report that tells us something other reports already told us. We knew we needed it. We knew it was in that place. We bought the property. We had, I think it was the architectural drawings done, and we've deferred it for three years. I'm sorry, two years. That would increase the cost. So how did we get to $7.5 million? And is, did the right company give us the right, the cost? Because I don't know why a development charge company would be doing that. Well, I think right now we're just seeing if we have any questions for Mr. Kwan, and then we can ask staff that those questions later. Is there any questions about the presentation? Oh, no, no. So, of council, do we have any other questions about the presentation? Quickly. Yep, Councillor uh, Cario. When you were talking, I didn't want to interrupt you, when you were talking mm -hmm. about, we were talking about comparatives, um, the ratios, when you were talking about similar ratios, were you talking about in the different categories, the ratios were similar as well, like the amount of calls, um, fire versus burning versus rescue versus medical. Is that, did you, is that what you meant as well? No, no, uh, uh, through your, your, your worship, uh, what, what I meant there was the ratio of firefighter per population that's what ratio. Yes. So then my other question would be, when you look at our, this table in our municipality, is it 
common to what you see in other municipalities as far as these ratios go. Like I, I thought it was a very small number of fires compared to, I thought maybe we should be buying more ambulances because we seem to be doing a lot, a lot more medical work than we do fire work. Mm -hmm. Huge difference. Is that normal from what you see in other studies you do? The, uh, um, of course, each community is different because of the, the population right. and, and everything. <clears throat> Uh, but uh, we do find that uh, the, the, the fire call uh, amounts are, are lower in most communities, uh, percentage-wise. Uh, the higher call volumes uh, really are in the medical, motor vehicle collisions, um, uh, suspicious calls, things like that. Even yes. in that, this much of a difference, like 3,000 to 94? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, it okay. can be, it can be, yes. Okay, thank you. To that point? Yeah, Councillor. And I would assume that it was the same in your community when you were chief. It's, it's quite often our firefighters who are the first responders who get yes. there before the ambulance, who stabilize and save the lives of the people until the ambulance gets there. Yeah. So a medical call is as important as a fire call. Oh, most definitely. Thank you. Most definitely, yes. Do we have should any other be questions? just done by medical. It should be done by the region, not the city. Didn't say that. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions to ask Councillor Thompson? Yeah. <clears throat> There's uh, been some suggestion that this has been delayed uh, and uh, over the last couple of years. I recall Chief uh, Smith uh, behind me saying uh, when we were buying the property on uh, Lundy's Lane, uh, <coughs> saying, and the question was asked, when should we go ahead with this? And he said, there would be a drop dead time with a report which would indicate when we would have to go ahead with this. And this is finally the drop dead report which uh, answers all the questions and uh, the information, st statistics that we have to make a major decision for this. I don't think anybody ever said why would we buy the property if we weren't going to put a fire hall there eventually? So uh, I want to compliment uh, you on your information and uh, your recommendations, and it gives us the opportunity now <coughs> to make a definitive decision to move ahead. Um, I was particularly uh, pleased to uh, see the recommendation about uh, fire safety and uh, <coughs> teaching the public about uh, uh, fire prevention. Um, I have a long history and I had to get up and uh, make a statement about this. My father was the uh, fire chief and he dedicated his uh, entire adult life to uh, doing fire prevention uh, and uh, I think he introduced, uh, uh, probably 50, 60 years ago, um, fire prevention efforts uh, in this community. And he went above and beyond that by having a uh, display which he traveled all over Ontario uh, with little uh, displays with buildings, explosions, <coughs> and uh, did all kinds of uh, effort. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to mention that because it always impressed me. Uh, he was in the schools constantly all over Ontario. So um, congratulations on your uh, report and your information. Makes it very easy to make a decision with respect to where we're going and how we're moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Campbell and then Peter Angelo. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> Just uh, reading the report, I thought it was excellent. But something stood out that I've been thinking about and talking about for some time. Thinking outside of the box, technology today should be <clears throat> significantly used to have ambulances going to where ambulances are required and police going to where police are required 
and fire trucks go into places that fire trucks are required, as opposed to all three of them go into the same event. And in terms of utilizing maximum number of dollars in the big picture, I think that that would improve significantly the care in our community. I don't know if anybody's thinking about that, but I recommend to staff that maybe this is going back to you, that you could take that into consideration and, and perhaps uh, think outside of the box. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Peter Angelo. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. I um, appreciate the, uh, the comments and the report, all the information that you brought us. I wanted to uh, make a motion that we approve the recommendation with a small addendum. Uh, the motion says that we receive the information and that we refer to staff for a report. I think it's incumbent upon us to give our uh, remarks, Your Worship. I would like to see us uh, incorporate the recommendations to move forward with the Station 7 on the west side of Niagara Falls uh, as part of staff's report that come back to us and basically how and when we do that. You know, Your Worship, I think we've contemplated this for a long time. We've told the residents that it's the right thing to put a station on the west side of Niagara Falls. I've always supported it. I, I think the number one factor that we need to look at is response times. And without that station on the west side, our response times become severely uh, compromised. So uh, with that, Your Worship, I'll put forward that motion that staff come back a report on how and when we implement these recommendations. Okay. Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Strange, that we receive the report <coughs> and we ask, pardon me? Questions. Yeah, I'm just going to finish reading uh, that we received the, the report or the uh, presentation and that we refer to staff and ask for uh, a when <coughs> a timeline. Is that right, Councilor Peter Angelo? How and when? How and when? Uh, uh, the staffing and when is when we build it. Okay. Yes, Councilor. We can debate it. Well, wait, there's nothing to debate. We didn't build when we we're going to like that's the reality I was the only one who voted against deferring it at the time because I really didn't think it was going to come back any different than it than it did today deferred cancelled referred however you want to call it we could have had that station built today and deal with the staffing report now and we could have put firefighters into a station and have that area covered now I, yeah I think we are are way behind the time but I'd like to ask the chief some questions I had done that earlier and you said wait till the end of his presentation yeah. so there's a motion on the floor now so to the chief does he think that um, phasing in the hiring is the way to do it because I look at it and think it puts us behind by the time we build that station should we start hiring now to staff it adequately or should we continue to wait or and, will this and, all come back in the report that we're going to get from council? Well, I would assume you'd answer that because I'm asking him. But also, what does he think about the preferred um, moving to staff um, from, I think it was the pumper truck? No, which was it? The aerial truck? Moving it to this location and bringing two staff from a fire uh, station to this location. Is it, does it affect service at all? Chief? Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to the councillor. So a couple of questions that she's asked with regards to uh, phasing it in. I mean, yes, my recommendation would be to hire, once the decision is to build, that we start to hire our staff as a two, two firefighters per year, so that we're, instead of dropping to our two on the aerial and being two years to build, and then four years out, we're eight years, we're looking at six years to be understaffed. So my recommendation at this point would be to um, start to hire now, or when, we make, when council makes the decision to build it, and then we would potentially drop our aerial to three, and then over the course of a couple of years, we would be back up to our normal staffing. Um, I think the other way is a great idea, and I, and I understand the total concept with regards to, you know, fiscally responsible, and I, I think if we can phase it in, it's, a, it's certainly a better way to go, but start pre-phasing it. The other comment, the other concern that I have is, um, I guess it's safety with regards to the aerial if we don't, if we drop it from two to, from four to two. Um, I believe that's, yes. does that answer your questions, Councillor? Yes, it does. And I did ask dollar questions. So the Chief just said, if we choose to build, is your, is your motion going to move today we've decided to build? When this moves forward, we're not, everything starts again, not waiting to, for a month for a report, but it start everything we read resumes tonight. So then, now can we talk about cost? Because we're, we've agreed we're going to build it. That's what 
Victor's motion is going to pass. How did we get to $7.5 million? Because the email I read the last time had showed there was $2.5, $2.6 million in development charges. The chief explained to me today that interest on the bill are recoverable by development charges. Building the building is recovered by development charges. Everything but staffing is recovered by development charges. How did we get to $7.5 million? Because I still don't have that. <coughs> chief? Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, well, I, so I think there's a little bit of misconfusion with regards to different reports. When Chief Smith <coughs> was here and when I took over from the position, and we, we continued to put estimates onto the capital budget. So back in 2016, the project was worth about $4.4 .4 million. In conversation with the architect, architectural firm that we've got uh, on retainer, which is Panici, uh, they indicated about a 7.5% increase per year. So the very first thing that happened in 2016 was we were gonna build the fire station and then it was realized by staff, uh, senior staff, that uh, we certainly needed a new uh, EOC. Um, for those that uh, have played in our emergency operations center downstairs in the basement in committee room two gets a little bit full. So we added that to the station which bumped at the 4.8. If you add 7.5% per year, uh, when you get into 2020, you're sitting at 6.5 million. Um, just adding that 7.5% increase. And then I spoke with the architect uh, again on those numbers, and what he's recommending is the 6.5, 6.2 million, he's saying, uh, by the time you add a fire truck, unfortunately fire trucks have gone up to 650 to 700,000 now. Uh, we start adding the equipment because if we buy a new truck, we need to add equipment. We don't have it to move, which we normally move it from one truck to another. So we're looking at about another 800,000, so we're pushing seven, $7.1 million. Um, when I was doing the capital budget estimate uh, for the 2019 estimate, I did take the, so I, we were in the middle of doing that development charges, and um, the number was very blatant to me at 7.4 in, in that report that I had read, so when we put it through to the city, that's what I recommended was 7.4. It's an estimate. Um, I'm expecting it to be lower. But the only way we can do it is if we do a Class C or a Class A um, costing. Okay. So until we go to tender, it's all estimates. No, I understand that. It would just seem to me that we made a decision that's costing us more money. We've ended up with the same <coughs> thing. We knew we had to have it. It all came down to staffing. And it would seem to me that the 7.5 increase he's talking about every year, we just cost ourselves money to do something we were going to do in 2017. It doesn't make any sense. Okay. So any other questions to the motion? So we have the motion uh, before you. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you very much, Mr. Quinn. Thank you very Thank much, Worship. Sure. <coughs> it looked that way, yes. Okay, now we're moving on to item 8.2, development charges background study. We've got Jackie Hall here of Hempson Consultants. <coughs> Yes, if you want to come to the microphone, sure. Whatever you're ready. Great. Yes. Um, so, Mr. Mayor, thank you this <coughs> evening for having me before you and members of council and the public as well. My name is Jackie Hall and I am a consultant from Hempson Consulting. I've had the pleasure of working with the city here on the 2019 development charges study update. Now, before I kind of get into a very brief high level presentation that I'll be giving this evening, I would just like to reiterate that this is a statutory public meeting which is required under section 12 of the Development Charges Act. So the whole idea and purpose of tonight is to allow the public to make representation on the information that was provided in relation to the proposed 2019 development charge rates. So um, as I'm sure most of you are aware, we, uh, we formally released a public background study on April 1st. It was not a joke, it actually happened. <coughs> and um, we also made the bylaw publicly available on April 16th. 
These are required in order to meet statutory uh, public consultation requirements as well. So all of this that we're doing today is, is in fulfillment of the requirements of the Development Charges Act. I'm just gonna spend a couple minutes just talking a little bit about the, uh, the city's current background study and what we're proposing to bring forward as part of the 2019 bylaw update. The city currently passed uh, or passed its current uh, development charge bylaw in Ju July 2014. There's a five year statutory life on that bylaw, so we are required to do an update in order to allow the city to continue to collect development charges. Uh, the 2014 study included a range of different services, which we're actually all bringing forward as part of this update. We call uh, this a mix of what we would say uh, soft or general services, so that includes library, parks and recreation. Um, uh, municipal works and fleet and transit and then more of the engineered services or hard services you might have heard that term before which includes things like roads and related infrastructure sidewalks water sanitary sewer and stormwater management um, as I mentioned before that effectively we must pass a new bylaw in order for the city to continue to collect development charges and just you know it is only applied to new development as well so Slide three just provides an overview of the calculated development charge rates. Uh, you can see that we have three residential rate categories here in the city. Singles and semi, uh, single and semi-detached units are calculated at $12,790 per unit. Rows and other multiples are at $8,022 and apartments are at $6,081. Uh, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, $6, um, the reason why the rates vary between the different uh, unit types is based on the occupancy. So the act requires us to relate the rates to the increase in need for service or the population residing in those dwelling units. So we actually used uh, Statistics Canada data in order to make that correlation. So that's why the rates vary between those unit types there. The pie graph here is just intended to show you what is representative of your charge itself. So similar to many other municipalities in Ontario, uh, engineered services, which are roads, water, wastewater, that makes up the bulk of your rate on the residential side. General services, including parks and rec, protection services, that makes up a little bit lesser of the rate. The city is somewhat unique in that it does have uh, area-specific non-residential charges, and this is intended just to reflect the different benefits uh, that are received from services that are within the core tourist area and then also outside of the core tourist area. Um, the rate here before you is uh, the rate that is outside of the core tourist area, so that applies to all development in the city, effectively out of the downtown area, and that's uh, been calculated at a rate of $43.15. Uh, you can see here, because non-residential services, we often don't attribute those to general services, including library, parks, and recreation, it's much more heavily weighted to engineered services, so that's your roads, water, and wastewater. <coughs> The inside the core tourist area has uh, a lower rate, and that's calculated at $26.41 per square meter. That's just intended to reflect the different infrastructure needs within the core tourist area versus outside, and then also the development that's occurring within that area as well. Now, um, this slide here just provides a very high level overview of the current versus calculated rate. The city's current rate is as of September 1st, 2018. So the top box uh, is just intended to show you how the single detached dwelling unit has changed since that time. So your current rate, if you were to come to the counter today uh, and you had a single detached building permit, you would be paying $12,592. Um, if the bylaw is passed and it is uh, made in force on uh, July 8th, like we're proposing, you would come in at the counter at that point in time and you would pay $12,790. So we're looking at a 2% or roughly $200 increase uh, on a single detached unit. Similarly, we're showing um, very uh, similar movement in terms of the increases on the non-residential side, both within the core tourist area and outside the core tourist area as well. At a very high level, I just wanted to um, provide a bit of an overview of the policy discussions that took place as part of this bylaw update. Um, something that we always do whenever we go back and we, we um, are looking to introduce a new bylaw as we look at the current exemptions, policies and practices, see what's working, see what's not. Um, we had some really good dialogue with staff in that respect, and so we're actually looking, um, by and large, to keep the exemptions in the uh, city's current bylaw pretty much intact and the same. We're making some minor language modifications just to make sure that we're in keeping with how development is uh, proceeding in the city. However, we are proposing two new exemptions. 
Uh, one is for single room uh, occupancy units accommodated within existing buildings. Um, these units are required to have both bedroom and sanitary facilities. This is uh, in relation to some recent dialogue that's been happening around the zoning bylaw. And then also we're looking to provide an exemption for secondary suites and new buildings. So just to provide a little bit of context, the Development Charges Act statutorily exempts the intensification of existing residential dwelling units. So for example, if you had a single detached dwelling and you were building an in-law suite in the basement, you wouldn't pay development charges on that. The city has no choice, that's in the legislation. Um, we have heard uh, some whispers from the province that they are perhaps going to be amending the Development Charges Act to uh, exempt those units outright when you come in at the time of building permit issuance. So if you were to come in today with a permit for a single detached and you wanted to do an in-law suite in the basement, it would actually trigger the payment of two development charges, one on the single detached dwelling and one on the apartment in the basement itself. All we're trying to do is just say, if you're going to have a secondary suite in uh, a dwelling unit at the time of building permit issuance, rather than having you come in in a year and rough it in and get the exemption, we're just gonna give you the exemption now. And it's very likely that we'll see that change actually come forward in uh, the changes to the, to the Development Charges Act when that happens. Ms. Hall, can I ask a question now? Is that just Absolutely. residential or commercial as well? That is just for residential. Okay. <clears throat> However, there are rules surrounding redevelopment and conversion credits that are in the bylaw. So for example, if you had a non-residential use, um, or even of residential use, we, we worked with staff on um, coining some of this language, but effectively, as long as you're not creating any new GFA, you're just converting the uses in the spaces, you're not subject to development charges. And so really today is a statutory public meeting as I, I, I made reference to, so we're happy to answer any sort of questions that the public has. Of course, if there's something a little bit more detailed, we're happy to provide a written response and perhaps to members of council as well. Um, we'll be working over the course of May just to make sure that everything's ready to go uh, for your consideration, which will be on uh, June 4th, 2019. And recognizing once again, we are running up against that deadline of July 8th, so we need to have a new bylaw in, passed, uh, in force and pass before that date. Okay, do we have any questions of council for Ms. Hall? Okay, is there anyone here? Uh, council now here from any members of the public who wish to speak to the develop the proposed development charges bylaw. Do we have anyone here that wishes to speak? <coughs> you need to come forward, state your name and your address, please. What's the final motion going to be to receive? Final motion. Uh, Mayor, mem members of council, my name is Frank DeLuca, 4341 Kilman Place, Niagara Falls. Um, I'd like to uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I uh, um, listened to the, uh, the uh, background in regards to that and I um, would ask that if you could just put up the slide in regards to the exemptions, if, it, if it's possible. Mm -hmm. no, can you put oh, the there we go. Oh. Thank you. There you go. Um, You're hired. I, I, I'm going to take a different tact on regards to this because I have a kind of a, a different approach and I'm asking that because of this con uh, the the uh, presentation was done in a different way I, I want to take an opportunity to actually address the exemptions and it was fortunate enough that the individual who came with the Allendale development kind of gave me a little bit of background information. Uh, and I want to repeat this again one more time. It's a $150, $150 million development. Development charges are going to be $6.3 million. The taxes, I think we're a little low, but $2.7 million. <coughs> That's a literally one and a half year payback. So, and then after that, you get a 33% of that in perpetuity. So, one of the questions that was asked, and I think it was answered by Mr. Hurlovich, was that there are no, uh, no existing costs for infrastructure. So that's where I'm getting at with the exemption. Why do we pay, <coughs> if somebody's gonna build a hotel, or build a development, or build a residential unit, <coughs> in between two residential units, or two hotels, or two that, why do they pay development charges? Because there are, no extra roads, no extra sidewalks, no extra water, no extra sanitary sewer, no stormwater management, 
Um, now, I would like to address the, uh, uh, in regards to the fire protection, obviously that if you're building more hotels, yes, you do <coughs> require a little bit more funding. So there's no other, no other expenses that are, are, are needed if you are building what, what I would consider infilling. So having said that, I would suggest and I would like you to take a look at the factors of exempting infilling projects. Um, <coughs> we've done it in the past. We've done it with Habitat for Humanity. I think it's a great <coughs> idea. I think that, that I think it should be able to do that with every project. Now, when it comes to subdivisions, the, um, when it comes to subdivisions, those are the charges. You're required, when you build subdivisions uh, in areas, you're gonna require more fire protection, you're gonna require more parks, you're gonna require all those things, including transit. <coughs> so, I think the, the, the particular aspect of it is that the concern is that we need to uh, increase our tax revenue um, in order to pay for all the things that we want to do in the future. And so government properties do not pay property tax. And my suggestion is that if we are concerned about increasing our tax base, then we should sell all our non-essential buildings to private enterprise to the highest bidder. All properties are assessed and if zoning changes are required, restrictions placed on those sites for approval, <coughs> but they be done by the city. These are properties that we own already, the city owns, and I can give you a couple of examples, the old bus station, Park and Zimmerman, and then looking at that, and we're talking about the last one on there talks about affordable housing. And one of the things that I think, if it was a municipal housing project, I think it should be for private uh, affordable housing as well. You have five properties, the two other ones that I was considering are ones that you lease, uh, Kitchener Victoria parking lot and the Kitchener Stanley area, selling them to a local developer for a nominal price to create a thousand units of affordable housing and 250 units of private housing ownership. They also, what I would suggest to be exempt from development charges. This, suggesting that in year one, you're looking at a $4 million sale surplus of lands that you own. Every year after that, as these uh, uh, affordable housing ownership uh, units are being built, it's another $4 million per year extra you're getting in tax revenue. The, uh, if you were to apply the same thing to the gentleman who came here and, and talked about his development um, about uh, Allendale, um, we have, as I understand correctly, 27 different projects that are in the works for hotels in Niagara Falls, in the Falls View, Clifton, and Lundy's Lane areas. If you were to exempt them from development charges because you're building a hotel between two different hotels, uh, you're looking at an increase on taxes. If at a rate of 3,500 per uh, unit, you're looking at an increase in the taxes of a million dollars a year. And if you were to build only 50% of the homes, or 50% of the hotels, you're looking at an extra $7 million in tax revenue. These are opportunities for a municipal council in Ontario to offer incentive to a builder to build in Niagara Falls. That's one of the, probably the biggest complaints that we've had I think around this horseshoe, the fact is that you complain that we do not have the incentives to offer people to build in this area. One of my biggest pet peeves, I think everybody knows this, is CN does not pay tax on their property. The CN rail, I suggest that we try to negotiate with them to dismantle it and sell off the portions to the railroad to adjacent owners. Um, the, uh, there's also developments that abut the railway right now Make, they can make changes to their developments. They have Fernwood, the Gale Center project, the Olympia condos, be given first opportunity for the lands to abut them and the possibility of increasing the amount of housing units in them. And I'd like to go back to, I'd like to talk about transit uh, separately and I'd like to also suggest that uh, given that this is uh, about $10 million in savings per year, 
simple suggestion would be it 10 million would about, about 10 percent in uh, decrease in uh, uh, sorry it's a 10 percent uh, increase in revenues I would suggest that seven percent of that go back to the residents and the other three percent go back to reserves to pay for what what needs to be paid now I want to go back to uh, transit part of it because that was the only thing on there that uh, needs to increase when you have uh, more people in, in the town. My <coughs> suggestion is that we take a look at <coughs> the possibility of offering, um, looking at the hotel tax again, looking at it to increasing it, and another suggestion was to look at a restaurant tax of a $1 for every meal over 10 bucks. Then offer uh, all tourists, all residents, free transit through Niagara Falls. Since the railway will not be here, we can offer a grid pattern, north, south, east, and west, and it would take less than 50 minutes to go from one end of the city to the other. This would be for both WeGo and Niagara Falls Transit. The new service could be run by the Niagara Falls Tourism as well as Niagara Falls City in, in conjunction. All riders will have ID cards, cards can be swiped in and out, and a database used for marketing and operational purposes. This will significantly reduce traffic in all areas of the city, a major reduction in employee parking for all businesses. The take on the taxes is about $18 million. So $8 million should go to tourism initiatives and $10 million to run the Transit Corporation. The more tourists that come year to year only increases those budgets. $2 million is not needed for transit and a further $200,000 per year for 20 years for the assets. We would require more bus drivers and those transferred, uh, sorry, on, uh, those NPC staff can be transferred to uh, run the buses throughout the whole city. And since the, the um, uh, ecotourism would flourish and even more dollars would flow our way from other level of governments because it's the right thing to do. Can you imagine that we come to a city that offers free transit to everybody? The other possibilities are offering to fund the Niagara Regional Transit routes coming to or from the falls. Um, and a link up with GO in the future would be seamless and would further our goal to become a GO destination as our transit system would be the best in Ontario. So my suggestion was to offer the savings back to the, the taxpayers. The other <coughs> suggestions to be looked at are based on our ideas. Tourism goes up. Tourism is able to fund its own expansion, which means more development, means more gambling, could possibly add more casinos, which means even more gaming revenue from OLG. This relates to more jobs, higher wages, more people coming to live in Niagara Falls, more houses, more commercial development, and its own expansion will be needed. Population goes up, compound factor kicks in, everything goes up means that even more taxes to pay for all the things we sacrificed in the past and hope for in the future. The average taxpayer could eventually realize a 25% tax reduction in perpetuity and other reductions will incur in the future as the other half of the hotels are built and more development comes to the area. Then maybe we can finally extend our urban boundary since the average taxpayer will have a lot more money in their pocket and they will spend it locally. Okay, thank you very much for that, Mr. Luca. And uh, maybe we could just at least ask Ms. Hall to address your main thing you said was you referenced no DCs for infilling is basically what you're suggesting. Commercial and residential. Right. So so maybe we can ask Ms. Hall if she could just comment on that part. Yes, absolutely. Through your worship. So just a couple of comments on infill development in general. So this, this is not an, a new concept that's come up before, um, especially through the public process. Um, and also oftentimes I get asked this question by staff. So infill development, what we actually find, and especially in um, working with uh, staff on, in terms of infrastructure planning and, and things like that, uh, infill development, because we're ultimately increasing the amount of people in the municipality or the amount of employees in the municipality, we are putting a demand on municipal services. While if you're building, say, an infill development between you know, two existing buildings, you may not need to necessarily build a new road. However, we acknowledge that the city's existing road network is 
citywide. And ultimately, um, as we continue to add greater amounts of population and employment, we are indeed putting demand on that service. And although it might not be a new road required directly in front of that hotel or that particular infill development, it might need to happen elsewhere in the municipality. So that's the one comment <coughs> there. In terms of overall policies, I have seen some municipalities look at perhaps providing partial exemptions, but most of the time it's limited to an extremely small geographic area. And it's mainly related to CIP, Community Improvement Plan policies and provisions. Any other questions or comments of Ms. Hall for her responses to Mr. DeLuca? And the other thing too, I know we mentioned um, uh, fire stations. We just heard tonight seven and a half million dollars for one and Ferry Street is an extension of Lundy's Lane. So I mean, it would be a direct, I would think, funder towards something like that. So, okay, well, we are looking for a, so now, all okay, right, thank you. If there's no questions from council, I thank Ms. Hull. Yes, oh, council, oh, we're not done yet. Councilor Peter Angelo. Um, yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Um, through you to probably Mr. Todd, um, the last time the DC bylaw came forward, you weren't here. I had a question, it was in regards to, I know that DCs, you can use them to fund water, sanitary sewer, stormwater management. I'm very keen to see the uh, South End Sewage Treatment Plant uh, move forward, and I know that the environmental assessment for that is already underway. Um, what I didn't see in the uh, background study is collection of DCs for that facility. So I guess my question is, uh, is Niagara Falls going to have to make a payment um, as well as the region in order to build that facility? And if so, why are we not collecting fees for it now? Well, through, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, the, that'll be the region's <coughs> responsibility. I believe they've got that or a good chunk of that in their DC study. And help me out here, if, if one municipality's charging DCs and collecting for that, you can't collect in two different places for the same thing. So um, they're collecting the develop, they're collecting DCs for the um, eligible developable, developable part of that. Yes, Mr. Mayor, if I may add just to that comment. Um, we did look at the region's background study. I believe this was perhaps raised at the council information session that um, Craig Benning had with yourselves earlier. So we actually did go back and do a little bit of a dive just to make sure that we didn't miss anything. So the region actually has the, the full amount of the project in their background study, as far as we can tell. Um, and they didn't show any costs attributed to any of the local municipalities. Now that doesn't preclude us from, uh, as part of future updates, if there is some sort of agreement that comes down at the falls, Niagara Falls is expected um, to make a contribution towards that project that we can't re-examine that particular facility as part of your next bylaw update. Okay, that's good. Thanks. That's good. Okay, well, there's no further questions or comments of council. The public meeting with respect to the proposed development charge bylaw is now concluded and we're looking for a motion to receive. Uh, yep, moved by Councillor uh, Dabrowski, second by Councillor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? Okay, thank you for that. Thank you very much, Ms. Hall. Yeah, I'm now gonna switch seats with uh, Councilor Peter Angelo. Yeah. yeah. And uh, as our budget chair, he is going to lead us in this part of the meeting. I did. That's what I think. That, that's why I said we are. Okay. Yeah. Okay, the uh, next item on the agenda is report TS 2019-12 dealing with the Cherubin update. And we have uh, St. John's Ambulance who is operating this service right now for the city of Niagara Falls. Um, we have Carla Stout, who is our manager of transit operations here, uh, to speak to us about this. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Carla, Transit. Uh, some of you I've spoken to just prior to coming uh, and uh, getting this underway for you. Um, this is really a high-level kind of broad overview of where Cherubin is right now. Uh, it's an update on some of the service enhancements that we've managed to realize just very recently, 
as well as uh, I guess I'm here as a resource for questions and answers with regards to uh, a fee-for-service formalization agreement that uh, staff is recommending to you this evening. Uh, so to just get underway, um, I'm not telling most of the people around this oval anything that they don't know, but Cheravan has uh, been in existence since 1972. Uh, it originally and does operate as a charitable organization with St. John Ambulance being your service provider here in the city. And that service is now fully funded by the city of Niagara Falls uh, through your budget process annually. Currently we provide service uh, to 700 plus minus, minus clients uh, that are registered on the service. Uh, we have six vehicles in full-time service plus two spare. Uh, we provide 25,000 uh, trips annually, and that was based on last year's ridership. Uh, but of note, on those 25,000 trips, there were 29,000 passengers. It is intended to be a shared ride service. It's supposed to realize some economies of scale that way. So the majority of those trips that are booked on those vans are pre-booked. Um, that would be called or considered a subscription trip. And they're mostly pre-booked for work, school, or medical appointments. And all of those trips are provided at a minimum curb to curb, and they are on shared ride. So the daily service, of course, is seven days a week uh, during the hours of service that we are uh, legislatively obligated to provide in a parity of service with our conventional transit. But the hours of operation, uh, generally for the operating of the vans, are 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. <coughs> Uh, Monday to Saturday and Saturday, Sunday and holidays from 7 to 7.30 uh, with some office and scheduling hours, uh, more tailored to business hours for St. John's <coughs> Ambulance staff. Uh, the service is available, of course, within the city's urban <coughs> boundary and companions and or children can accompany uh, their fee-paying fee -paying client uh, based on our demand, uh, but personal care or support attendance ride free. So with the fare structure, we do have full fare parity with our conventional transit. It doesn't cost you any more to ride a specialized van than it does to ride the regular bus. And that is legislated by the province. The new fare boxes uh, were installed on the vans in late 2018. Uh, so Cheravan now accepts iRide cards. I don't know if any of you have seen an iRide card, but an iRide card is something that we take on board our conventional transit and it creates kind of a, a pass tap system for persons getting on the conventional buses. So we're now going to be rolling out iRide cards as our fair media product on the Cheravan. And what that does is it allows for a seamless delivery from people getting on and off Cheravan and getting on and off the conventional transit. So it provides a synergy system from one to the other. AODA compliance, the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. Um, staff is working very actively with the Accessibility Advisory Committee here at the city uh, to establish an appeal process uh, for any denied or discontinued service applica applications to Cheravan. Um, understanding that we've never actually had a denial or a discontinued oh. service application on Cheravan. But we are required under the legislation to formalize the process and have a committee in place. Uh, so we have reached out to our Accessibility Advisory Committee. Uh, they are interested and are going to become our Appeals Committee. Um, and we are just in the process of finalizing their terms of reference and their mandate. Uh, we will also be reviewing compassionate eligibility for service with the committee as well. Some new processes that we've established uh, in 2018 and early 2019. Uh, we do have uh, some new submission options for applications for anyone who wants to join us on Cheravan. Uh, they can do that in person, they can do it by fax or email now, and they can even do it online through the website. Um, upon approval, a new registrant uh, client receives a written confirmation uh, welcoming them to our service. Um, some customer service information and our rules and guidelines for, you know, for being on board. And a user guide is what we have under development right now. We're trying to make all of that information friendly and we're trying to make sure that it goes out uh, with that initial letter and that initial contact to, uh, to the new client. The application now allows the Niagara region uh, to share information 
uh, so that they can issue a new universal attendant card pass. And that's an initiative that the region's undertaken. Um, what that looks like is across the region, um, a number of clients on a number of systems require personal care support. At this time, we don't have any way to identify those persons as an attendant for that client. Uh, so the region has undertaken that past program. So we're just getting out ahead of that and including that uh, rider in our application asking our clients if it's okay if we share their information. So that's what that is. Um, and the new compressed application form is available uh, for our nursing home residents and their staff and families. We're trying to streamline that process uh, for, uh, for our elder care facilities and for staff and families who are working on behalf of our new clients. Transportation Services has implemented uh, new scheduling software with Cheravan. Uh, Cheravan has been uh, working very hard uh, to maximize their efficiencies and accommodate more riders in <coughs> using our new Novus product. Um, they have had increased shared trips, so we know we're doing something right. Uh, the automatic callback <coughs> system to confirm bookings is now in place and underway. Uh, what that is, is that is an automated response that calls people that have a trip uh, upcoming either the next day within 24 to 48 hours and it just gives them a simple reminder just by almost like picking up on a voicemail that lets them know that their trip is still scheduled and booked for what time and what date. And it ensures better access to uh, medical facilities for us as well. Uh, staff has worked cooperatively with uh, the Niagara Health System to improve our access to the main entrance at GNGH as well. So working towards a barrier-free Niagara, uh, the Niagara Region Specialized Transit Study has commenced uh, just recently in the past few months in 2019. Uh, Onboard and online surveys are now being distributed by local providers, including ourselves uh, and St. John's Ambulance to provide um, an area for our readers to get their feedback into that study process. Public consultation is ongoing and some public meetings have been underway. And the study purpose on behalf of the region is to establish the best way forward, addressing the challenges and opportunities uh, for the operation of specialized transit across Niagara. So the recommendations and next steps in the report that you're uh, considering this evening uh, is that council approve a <coughs> formalized fee for service agreement for one year uh, with an option to renew for an additional year with St. John's Ambulance for the provision of our specialized transportation service. <coughs> that council approve the establishment of the appeal committee with our Mayor's Accessibility Advisory Committee and that staff will finalize the new uh, policy and procedures documentation and that will actually serve as the body or the form of agreement that we enter into uh, to formalize with St. John's Ambulance and that will set the standard by which uh, the city sets its expectations around its delivery of Cheravan and the customer service that it expects. So staff will ensure that clients are informed and advised of the services available as we go through this process. We'll provide an opportunity for input into the consultation process at the regional level and at the local level and inform council on any proposed changes to the existing service coming forward. So that's all I have for you. If uh, you have something have any for me. questions or comments I've missed out? Uh, Councilor Lacopo. Thank you so much for the presentation. It's a great service for us to have in our community. Since I have missed out here, we were talking about me riding the buses because I wanted to get, <laughs> get to know our community and see what we do provide and where we can improve. And when I was talking to Ms. Stout, we came up with the idea of challenging all of our counselors to go for a ride in May once the new schedule comes out. So I'd like to put that out there and thank you so much thank for you. this presentation and, and all the work that you've been doing with And me. I'm willing to be the tour guide, whoever wants to come forward. along. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, I think the recommendations are very easy to support. I mean, uh, we all know that Cheravan is a great service that we have here mm -hmm. in our community. Uh, being in the room that I am in the school system, um, Cheravan was our main supplier, uh, for my room anyway, of okay. uh, transportation sure. for the children for a long time. And, and I know that a lot of children in my room still use that service. So can't say enough good things about it, the empathy that the workers have and the service that you provide. So congratulations, Thanks. kudos to you. Thanks. Councilor Campbell. Uh, just a quick question. There is a charge to use the service? Yes. And how much is that? I don't, didn't see that in the <coughs> 
so the fares on the chairvan are equal to the to the conventional service we're mandated under legislation to do that so right now a regular rider on chairvan pays three dollars uh, for their trip without a discounted pass or what have you much like the same as getting on a conventional vehicle yeah okay so looking for a motion to approve the recommendations i have a motion by council of the coco seconded by council of strange if there's no other comments i'll call the vote all those in favor Opposed, motion is carried. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for coming. Councillor Coco. Can I make the motion to challenge councillors for a bus ride? In oh, May? for sure, absolutely. I think that one was seconded by Councillor Strange as well. I'm driving. You're driving? Uh oh. No, we don't need TV cameras. <laughs> <laughs> no TV cameras. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, we, we have a motion on the floor to challenge all the council to, uh, to ride the bus in May. I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? It's official. It's official. All right, next we have the 2019 parking budget. We have uh, two of our staff per, uh, people here, uh, Ms. Clark and, uh, and Mr. Brown. Uh, Ms. Clark is our acting director of finance, and uh, Mr. Brown is our manager of parking. Uh, welcome to both of you. I'm not sure if I'm going to hand it over to you, Tiffany, or, or to Paul. You'll, you'll start, okay. <coughs> Someone hijacked your controls. I don't know. Oh, someone's got the remote there. Oh, I have the remote. Oh. I was just oh. waiting. You're swinging it around. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, okay, I'll try to get through this quickly, but feel free to stop me if you have any questions. Uh, I know we still have a lot to go in our agenda. So we're going to look at the proposed revenues and expenses for our 2019 draft parking budget. Um, and then Paul's going to jump in and give an update on new and ongoing parking initiatives. So this is a look at our revenues. We've got our permit revenue permit revenue going down slightly, uh, user fees slight increase, <coughs> fines again slight decrease. The other revenue, 26,000, um, this doesn't exist in 2019. This was in relation to the free parking, the downtown free parking. So the city was contributing 13,000 from the downtown CIP and the downtown BIA was contributing 13,000. Um, but as council's aware, that's recently uh, been proposed to be changed by downtown BIA to paid parking. So that takes that revenue component out. From an expenditure standpoint, slight decrease in the salaries and wages. This is just a reallocation of a uh, staff member towards the property tax traffic budget. Um, there's really not a lot of other major things to note here, but if there are any questions, feel free to ask. Um, parking's a self-funded budget, um, so what's good to note is the transfer, we're projecting a $41,000 surplus, which to balance the budget is reflected as a transfer to reserves. So that's a good news story. This is just a look at the parking budget broken down by Responsibility Center, which in the case of parking is, is uh, parking maintenance and then all of the various different lots. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go through them in detail. And on the next slide, we have the rest of the lots. And then at the bottom is our parking control services. I'm going to turn it over to Paul. Okay, good evening. Welcome. I'm just going to go over some of the initiatives that we're working through in this year. Um, we're going to start with the Falls View parking area. We generally don't have any surface lots in Falls View, and with the developments taking place there, we are looking at in, uh, implementing some parking for on street to help offset some of the issues that we may come across with the uh, new developments in the theater that's in the area. So we can help, uh, you know, put in some extra parking in there, and uh, we would do that um, all within that business area, so it wouldn't impact the residential area. Uh, Queen Street itself, uh, the BIA has requested that they go back to a paid parking opportunity. This is a, a good idea for the fact that it allows the um, customers in that area not that limited 90 minute which they're experiencing up to this point. They can extend their stays, they can return. Um, so we agree with that. We think it's a good, uh, good beneficial for that area. So we are looking at implementing paid parking as of July. Uh, Honk Mobile is a, uh, next sorry. Hawk Mobile, this is, a, I think, is a really good success story for us. Uh, last year, we had uh, 6,500 users in transactions. Uh, basically, that is paying for parking on your phone. The, the great option of this is that if you're somewhere, your parking is about to expire, the phone will notify you. You can add time, do that kind of transaction. Uh, 
at this time last year, we had about 600 transactions by the end of April. Right now we're sitting out at 1,300. So we're almost doubling the usage here and we continue to try to promote this. We will be adding signage and, uh, and really trying to make it useful for the public. Uh, we're even going to a new um, test bed right now where we will allow people to just do a quick, um, um, they'll open a web page and they won't have to download an app. So any one-off visitors at the, at the city won't even have to look for an app. They can basically do it as a one-off as well. So hopefully that'll work out even better for them. I'm just going to pause you for a second. Sure. I the mayor who wanted to talk on that. Yeah, I just had a question. Um, it's great, the hot mobile. Is it mostly locals using it, using it or is it out of town? Is there, do you have a split by any chance through uh, Mr. Chair? Oh, sorry. Uh, through the chair. Um, we haven't, uh, I haven't identified exactly what the statistics, we can look at it and say whether they're the locals or users. I know I'm getting a lot of excellent feedback from the locals and, and I do know that the tourists, uh, in speaking with the downtown BIA, a lot of the business owners are really excited about this because they can pre-purchase parking for their clientele coming down uh, who are going to come into their facilities and, and, and book a time frame, they can do it. So overall, it's being adapted by everybody. There's a lot of use in, in the tourist area, around the hospital area, because it is a citywide. So anywhere there is parking, it is rolled out. It isn't just isolated to our tourist area. So, okay. Uh, U.S. plate collections. This is something we had gone for several years. We had, unfortunately, the company that we were dealing with was bought out and the program did end. Uh, we have brought this program back in uh, through our, um, our uh, enforcement suppliers. They're able to do that. The nice thing about doing this now is that not only do we get the revenue back that we're not getting on the, uh, the collections and not paying them the tickets, but we also can this time around provide the same opportunity for review of the ticket and a hearing process, which we couldn't do uh, with our past bylaw through the Provincial Offenses Act. So those who are here, they, they are a tourist, they are a visitor, they have the same ability and rights to, <coughs> to talk about that, that ticket and discuss it. And, and I think that's a good positive in this move. So. And the last is the rate strategic plan. Um, basically, we're adapting a process that's uh, very popular in Europe and in the uh, Western United States, which is dynamic parking cost. This allows us to look at, and we, we adapted a, a bylaw uh, just last year. It allows us to look at the rates that we have and instead of just having a bylaw saying the rate is going to be this in this parking lot, we can look at the use of the area and say, hey, on very large special events, we can set a flat rate that's comparable to the uh, parking lots around us. We can compete with our competitors. We can be uh, useful to them. And at the same time, we can then supply parking at a different rate for the city. Uh, and a good example is in the, um, uh, in the down season when, when it gets pretty quiet in the tourist area and stuff, we can drop our rates down to $5 all day parking or extend parking rates and get people into those areas that those businesses might see a, a real drop in, in resources. We can support them by giving that. Areas that are quieter, um, we can then say, hey, here's extended, here's rate value. And we advertise that on our, uh, on our Honk Mobile and on our website. So that strategic plan allows us to adapt that way. So when there is an event coming up, we can be uh, competitive and comparable, and we also support the community. So these are what we're moving forward with in parking. That's it, thank you. Okay, any questions of Mr. Brown? Uh, if not, then you would be looking for a motion to approve the parking budget. That's correct. Motion by Councillor Campbell, seconded by Councillor Strange. If there isn't any comments, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And the motion's carried. Thanks very much, Thank Mr. You. Brown. Appreciate it. All right, next we have report F 2019-14, dealing with uh, new water and sewer policies. And I'm looking for Ms. Ferguson. Welcome. Amber is our manager of revenue, and she's going to go through the 2019 water policy presentation. Okay, um, so this presentation is highlighting the information from report F 2019-14, the water sewer policies in the council agenda. So background, the city currently does not have any council endorsed water and sewer policies. So staff would like to formalize the process to provide consistent customer service to the residents. Research was completed to determine what other municipalities are, have in place, and the legal department was consulted to ensure all policies are compliant. So there's eight policies that I'm going to be presenting this evening. Um, the, first three or the first policy has three options, and then all the rest will just be presented with one option. <coughs> 
Okay, so the water sewer collection policy, under all three options, staff is recommending changing the penalty rate from the current one-time 5% penalty to a monthly 1.25% penalty. This will decrease the penalty revenue earned, but it'll allow for greater consistency to, rev to residents as penalty on water will now be charged in the same manner as penalty on taxes. Okay, so our collection policy option number one is the status quo. So this is doing exactly what we're doing now. So owner accounts, owner accounts in arrears are transferred to the tax roll three times a year per the billing schedule. And then tenant accounts. In order for an account to be started in a tenant's name, the tenant must pay a $230 deposit. Tenant accounts in arrears receive one reminder notice followed by a disconnection notice. And if the account remains unpaid, the tenant account is disconnected. If the water remains off of the property or the tenant leaves the property and a final bill is not paid, the deposit is applied to the tenant's account. And then any remaining balance is transferred to the credit bureau for collections. So the second option for the collections policy is modifying our current policy. For owner accounts, this will, things will stay the exact same. For tenant accounts, everything will be the same except at the end of the collection process. So after the disconnection or the move out and the deposit is applied, if a balance is outstanding, the balance will be transferred to the owner's taxes instead of sending to the credit bureau for collections. <coughs> so under this policy, we would uh, implement a, a plan to notify the landlords of the changes and this would allow for 100% recovery of our outstanding water balances. So the third option is our recommendation. So water and sewer accounts will only be established in the owner's name. Only the owner shall be liable for payment to the city for all water and sewer rates, <coughs> fees and charges. Past due accounts will be transferred to the tax roll. And if this option is chosen, the implementation would be January 1st, 2020. Current tenant accounts would not be impacted as they would be grandfathered in. So this option would allow for 100% recovery of all past due balances. It would also eliminate almost all water disconnections. Only the disconnections for owner accounts in three years tax arrears would occur. And if chosen, staff would report back with an implementation plan. So the information on this slide is summarizing what the other local area municipalities are currently doing in regards to tenant collections. So whether they have tenant accounts, whether they require a deposit from the tenant accounts, if they put an account in care of the tenant's name, and if they transfer tenant arrears to the tax roll. So there's no municipal water in Wainfleet, so the 10 other local area municipalities were considered. Of the 10, all other local area municipalities are transferring arrears to the tax roll. We are the only municipality that's using a third party collection agency. Of these 10, only one other municipality is opening accounts in tenants' names, and that's Niagara on the Lake. Six of the 10 municipalities allow for the accounts to be placed in care of the tenant name, with the arrears eventually being transferred <coughs> to the owner's tax roll which is similar to our option two. St. Catharines just passed this year that they will continue to put an account in care of the tenant's name, but they're no longer disconnecting. The first unpaid bill is transferred to the owner's taxes. So four of the 10 municipalities, including St. Catharines, are no longer dealing with tenants, um, all similar to our recommendation number three. Okay, so some statistics on our collection policy. So we have 2,525 tenant accounts, 27,868 owner accounts, and 30,393 total active accounts. So since 2014, when we took over the water billing, $117,844 is outstanding with the Credit Bureau. <coughs> our average collection rate is only 17%. The average account balance outstanding with the credit bureau is $226 and our highest account with the credit bureau is $12,120 and that's been outstanding since January of 2017. 
So if option two or option three is approved tonight, the city on a go forward basis would have full recovery of outstanding water accounts. Eventually, this $117,000 outstanding at the Credit Bureau will need to be written off, and therefore the expense will have to be absorbed in the water and sewer rates. Can I just, uh, sorry, can I just yeah. ask, is the $12,000 bill, is that a residential bill? No, it's not. It's not, okay. Yes. Okay, so lastly on this is staff time that's spent on tenant accounts. So between finance and environmental services, <coughs> 76 hours of staff time per week is spent on tenant accounts. <coughs> so if option three is chosen, um, this 76 hours of staff time could be repurposed to increase organizational efficiencies. Sorry, that leads me to another question. Is there a breakdown between residential and commercial? Like I know <coughs> a figure of 117,000, is that made up of residential and commercial? Yes, it is. And if so, what do you do on the commercial side? For commercials, we follow the same procedure, um, but the commercial deposits are higher. So the, um, the commercial tenant pays based on the size of the meter. So the initial deposit that we take in from the commercial customers is higher. And, 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 and any idea what the breakdown would be on the one side? I'm, I'm not sure, I, I could 50, get 50, it for 60, 40. It's most It's mostly residential. Okay, Councilor Carrier. <clears throat> we go back to that screen about the uh, unpaid Portion was a hundred and what was that? I'm sorry, one hundred and seventeen thousand. Yeah. Okay. What percentage of that is um, of the total amount of money? I think it really only means something if we knew how much money was collected, as opposed to how much wasn't. So if there was eleven million dollars collected, it would be a very small piece. So we really need to know what type of dollars are involved at the other end of that to know if that's a significant number or not. As it seems to me, it's four years old, and there's a lot of accounts that you guys have accounted for. It seems like it's a very small number in relation to the size of the, the money that flows through these accounts. Well, it's, it's only related to the 2,500 tenant accounts, that 117,000. Right. Four years. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so the next policy is our high water consumption adjustment policy. So what we're looking to do here is formalize and update our current procedure. So this is when we have a residential account with a leak. So we'd like to modify the current procedure. Currently a one-time rebate of 38 cents per cubic meter on excess consumption is given during a period of a leak. We'd like to update this to 50% of the volumetric charges on excess consumption during a period of a leak. So if a, a resident had excess consumption of 500 cubic meters, under the previous rebate, they would receive a rebate of $190. Under the new policy, they would receive a rebate of $554.50. So this results in a 65% increase for residents receiving the rebate. And this also allows for the rebate to adjust each year with the changing water and sewer rates. So next is the water and sewer back billing policy. So this is a creation of a new formal policy. A policy is needed when a water account is found with a lapse in billing, a billing error, or has never been billed. The back billing period will be for a maximum of two years from the date of discovery, based on a reasonable estimate of the volumetric and service charges for the period. Reluctant water and sewer charges policy this is a creation of a formal policy for our current procedure. So this is what we're currently doing. The reluctant water and sewer rate is used when an account holder refuses to allow access to city employees to complete repairs or inspections on a water meter. Two letters are mailed followed by a registered letter requesting the owner contact the city. If no response, the city will place the account on the reluctant water and sewer rate. And adjustments to the reluctant rate will only be made for a maximum of a six month period. And if the issue is due to a reading <coughs> error, not the accuracy or absence of a water meter. So water disconnection and reconnection policy. So again, this is just a creation of a formal policy for what we're currently doing. 
This is popular for snowbirds or for people who go away for an extended period of time. So at an owner's written request, the water to a property may be disconnected for a fee. When the water is disconnected, the account is stopped and no further billing occurs. And then at an owner's written request, the water to a property may be reconnected for a fee. And when the water is reconnected, the account is restarted and the billing will commence. If an account is requested to be disconnected, but the disconnection failed to occur due to a repair needed on the curb stop, a billing adjustment will be completed for the time period where the water was to be shut off, provided there's no usage at the property during that time. On that point? On the last point? Okay. Sorry, just going to interrupt you for yeah. another second. Uh, could we go back one slide? I, 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 I wanted to ask a question. <clears throat> No, the one that says two years. Yeah, that's that's it. That's it. So just my question to you, Mr. Chair, is so it says a policy needs a policy is needed when a account is for whatever reason in arrears. So it's suggesting we go back for two years. What's the current policy on that? This is a, uh, This is not for when it's in arrears. This is for when there, it, the account actually hasn't been billed. So when there's been some sort of error or we found a meter that's never been billed before. Um, cur what we're currently doing it based on our talks with legal is we're, we are back billing for two years, but we just don't have this formal policy in place. Okay, so our current procedure is to go back two years, but we don't actually have a formal policy yes. for it. Okay, yes. so my only question is if we went to your very first part uh, recommendation three to put this on the landlord something like this we could have a situation where there's a faulty meter and it runs for two years and then we're going to put that on the landlord potentially I can see that being a conflict of these two policies I can see that being something I'd be very concerned about but uh, okay thank you I just want okay. a clarification on the current procedure thank you Okay, so collection of water sewer arrears from condominiums. So this is the creation of a formal policy. So a policy is needed for transferring outstanding water arrears on condominium utility accounts where there's one large meter servicing the entire condominium and individual tax accounts. Arrears for the single large water meter will be transferred proportionately to each individual roll number based on the percentage of current value assessment over the total assessment of all the properties in the condo corporation. Estimating consumption on malfunctioning water meters. So this is creation of a formal policy for our current procedure. Policy is needed when estimating water consumption when a meter has malfunctioned and stopped recording consumption. A reasonable estimate of consumption will be billed throughout the time period of the malfunctioning water meter based on the account holder's average consumption before the meter malfunctioned. <coughs> okay, and then lastly, our tenant water and sewer account policies. Again, this is a creation of a formal policy for our current procedure. And these policies are dependent on the options selected in the collections policy. The collections policy. So this will only apply if option number one or option number two is selected. Tenant start dates. The city will only use the start date on the tenant connection agreement as the legal start date for the tenant's <coughs> account. Any disputes between start dates must be taken up between the landlord and the tenant. And then tenant name changes. This situation arises when a prior tenant and a new tenant were residing at the property and the prior tenant has requested the deposit to remain on the account for the new tenant. The tenant leaving the property must sign documentation stating they're transferring the deposit to the new tenant. The new tenant must sign a new connection agreement and staff will simply change the name on the account, not terminate and start a new account. Okay, so our recommendations. So number one, the council adopt option three of the proposed water and sewer collection policy. Number two, in the event that option three is not chosen in recommendation number one, staff would recommend a minimum that option two be recommended to keep Niagara Falls consistent with the other collection policies across the Niagara region. That council adopt the proposed water and sewer policies, 
So the high water consumption adjustment policy, the water sewer back billing policy, the reluctant water sewer charges policy, the water disconnection and reconnection policy, the collection of water and sewer arrears from condominium pro policy, and estimating consumption on malfunctioning water meters policy. And then lastly, in the event that option three is not chosen and recommendation number one, that council adopt the water and sewer tenant policy. <coughs> That's everything. Does anyone have any questions for Ms. Ferguson? Councilor Strange. Um, I'm just looking at the, so the status quo, um, just trying to get this straight, the tenant pays a $230 deposit. That's a, yeah, a residential tenant. A residential tenant. And then um, how, how, how many months would it go until you, that would go into arrears that you would stop that? It's a two month process. Okay. Um, so the tenant receives their bill. Um, and if they don't pay within it, two months, then yeah. you would shut it off or yes. disconnect? What now, we try to do is that we have the water disconnected before the tenant receives their next bill and we bill every two months. Okay. But like, I don't think a bill would be more than $230, would it, in the first? Like, would you just keep that deposit? Like, I don't understand how it would go on the, on the landlord. It'd be anything above and beyond once the deposit has been applied. Okay. Okay, thank you. Councilor Lacopo. On the disconnection, reconnection, you said for a fee that it could be disconnected and then for a fee reconnected, what's the fee? Right now it's $55. Okay, thank you. Mr. Mayor. Well, I'm happy to make a motion here, but I, I'm not gonna support option two or three. I'm gonna go to option one. And I'm gonna challenge staff to come back with other options within our purview where we collect the money. I don't support putting it on the backs of the, the landlords. We already have a problem with not enough rental units in the city, and then we're gonna put more pressure on the landlords. My suggestion is gonna, or my recommendation, my motion is gonna be, I move the recommendation, with the exception of one would be option one, and I challenge staff to come back and explore other options, including small claims court, uh, greater deposits, and or maybe a percentage of their monthly, of their, uh, bi-monthly water bill, having a deposit portion of Because I understand some rental people don't have the money for a bigger deposit. I get that. So we take our 230, is that what we take? And then maybe we collect so much per month, or per bill, and we put that into a fund for uh, if they miss their payment or they don't make their payment. I just don't want, I don't like the idea of us deferring all responsibility onto the landlord, you go collect it. Regardless if that's what St. Catherine's doing, it. I think it's a bad idea, it's a bad policy. And uh, that would be my motion. Okay, so if I can just understand the motion, it's to um, approve <coughs> attachment one, but have staff report back on alternative ways. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Recommendation one. Option recommendation one. one, option one, and then approve attachments four to ten as well. Is that correct? Uh, four. You mean uh, seven hundred point two four? Like yeah, so yes. it's the high water consumption adjustment, yes. the water, water sewer, sewer back billing yes. policy. So Correct. approve all those ones down from attachment four? Yes. Okay. And I have a second there by Councillor Strange. Um, anyone have any questions or comments to the motion? Okay, I've already declared a conflict on one, two, three, and eight. So I'll call the vote. There's I'll, one, excuse me, uh, yep. in option three, or <coughs> recommendation three, is that if we don't choose three, we're recommending that we move the uh, start dates and name changes. So I don't know what that, how that, we have to um, deal with that as well. That'd be included. That'd be included, okay. That'd be included. Yeah. Okay. I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried unanimously. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Ms. Ferguson. Thank you. Okay, and uh, under 8.6, we have our 2019 water, wastewater budget presentation. And I'll go to Ms. Clark again. Is our acting director of finance.
I'm going to go through the uh, service delivery for the region and the city responsibilities, uh, breakdown of expenditures, review the asset management plan, and highlight some of the rebate programs. So for the region, uh, sorry, the region is a service provider of water to the city of Niagara Falls. So we purchase the water from the region and then we, um, they're responsible for water, wastewater treatment facilities and pumping stations, part of the water network in the city, uh, responsible for sewers spanning a municipal boundary. And, uh, well, that's it for responsibilities. <laughs> the regional rate structure to the city for water is 75% variable, 25% fixed, and for wastewater, it's 100% fixed. The region's also a co-contributor to some of our capital projects through combined sewer overflow program. Um, the City of Niagara Falls councils the management authority and responsible for the water and sewer systems. Staff administers this responsibility in two parts, with operations being administered by the Municipal Works Department and billing and collection administered by the Finance Department. Uh, the City also provides maintenance and replacement of your water distribution, our water distribution system and our wastewater collection network, and we're responsible to directly charge residents for water and wastewater services as well as provide customer service, service to ratepayers with respect to issues or questions regarding water and wastewater services. <coughs> so this slide is a high level summary of the total um, expenses in the water budget. So we can see that 54% of the costs uh, represent regional costs and 46% represent the city costs for a total expense of 22 million. The next slide just gives a further breakdown. So of that 22 million, 8.9 is the region's volumetric charge going up 3.2%. We've got the regional fixed charges at 3 million. This is our ask this year in line with uh, the BMA recommendation from the long range financial plan is to in increase the city's capital contribution from 4.1 million to 5 million. That's a $900,000 increase. And then our city uh, operating charges are going up by just a small 1.6% or 1.7 almost. Then when we take away our non-rate revenues, so our user fees, disconnection, reconnection fees, we're left with the amount to be raised from the rates, which is the 29.3 million. So some key points about our water budget. We've already covered the regional costs are 75% volumetric, 25% fixed. Within this budget, we're requesting within the water budget, we're requesting the following new staff, <coughs> one six month casual seasonal laborer and one eight month co-op student. We've also, I just covered, we've proposed the $900,000 increase in capital in line with the recommendation in the BMA water wastewater long range financial plan. So council may recall that Jim Brzee spoke to us um, about this indicating that while our rates are some of the lowest in the region, our infrastructure is also some of the oldest in the region and requires attention. Uh, the capital spending of $5 million in the budget is still lower than the asset management plan requirements of $6 million. Um, this is partially offset by the use of the OLG contribution funds. And then for Council's reference, the annual amortization of the water system is $1.6 million. These next three slides I'm not going to spend a lot of time on. They're a repeat from the capital budget. I just wanted to bring them forward again to highlight uh, specifically our water network has um, replacement cost value of 296 million and our sanitary sewer network has a replacement value of 491 million dollars as of the uh, 2013 uh, asset management plan. This just shows, um, the next slide shows this a little bit better. This just shows our, uh, the annual funding investment required for water is about 6 million, 6.1 almost. And the total funding right now is 4.1 million, so that leaves an annual def funding deficit of almost 2 million. With the extra 900,000 proposed, that will bring that annual deficit down to 1.1 million. In the sewer network, uh, or wastewater, that's um, the annual funding requirement is suggested to be 6.5 million. We're currently funding 4.73 million, leaving an annual deficit of 1.7 million. I know, I know you talked about the OLG funds as well. Are there any projects from there that council chooses that kind of bridge that gap? Yes, there would be. There would be, but we don't have, uh, like I know you said there's a deficit, but I'm wondering if there still is a deficit um, based on the projects that council approves from the OLG funding. Three, Mr. Chair, it would depend each year, I guess, um, where we decide to use the OLG money. So we don't have a specific 
um, amount of the OLG money set aside specifically for water and sewer. So it would simply depend on how we allocate them. I'd have to look through the capital budget to see specifically how much of our OLG money we used for water and sewer this year. So I wanted to take the opportunity in this budget to highlight a lot of the rebate programs that are included. Um, this is just a refresher. Uh, the senior water account rebate is a $100 water credit available to um, City of Niagara Falls water customers and property owners who reside at the property age 65 and older receiving the federal guaranteed income supplement. Uh, we have a budget of $68,000 which allows us to process 680 applications. As of 2000, or in 2018, we approved 568 applications. The toilet retrofit program rebate, we've got a budget of about $20,000, which would service 334 applications, and it's a $60 water account credit available to City of Niagara Falls uh, water customers who purchase up to two efficiency toilets for single or multifamily residential units. Um, there are a number of qualifications. All of these programs are on our website, so for more detail, this is just a snippet of them. For more detailed information, please go to our website where you can find the applications and the eligibility. The high water consumption adjustment, so this is already outdated since council just approved the revised policy. Um, there's a budget of $20,000 included in the 2019 budget, and um, now it's going to be a 50% rebate of the rates each year. It will update. This is for residential customers only, one time only rebate per account holder per property address. The rain barrel rebate program was introduced to council at the last council meeting April 9th and there's a, in part of the water conservation program report. There's a budget of $15,000 which will service at least 300 applications. And sorry, I just forgot something. So, and it's going to be a 50% rebate up to $50, and what I didn't include on the slide, but it's important, is per residential water account per calendar year of the purchase price of a qualifying rain barrel from any Canadian retailer. The flowy rebate, also included in the water conservation report at the last meeting, budget of $20,000, so interested residents can purchase the device online through Alert Labs website, and using a City of Niagara Falls promotional code, the resident would pay a discounted rate of $240 for the device, which includes one year monitoring of the service. And then our sod watering rebate, this isn't new, a uh, budget of $2,000, which is 200 applications. The City of Niagara Falls always provides a $10 sod watering rebate to any resident who experienced sod damage as a result of City of Niagara Falls operations. And that's, of course, to help with the watering of the sod so that it does not die. The next slides are going to go through the wastewater budget. So um, wastewater costs from the region are about 62% of this budget and 38% city costs for a total of almost 25 million. Further breakdown of this, um, the regional costs are about, they appear to be a 17% increase, but in the, in the previous treasurer's presentation, he did indicate that um, they were going to use a transfer from reserves for the reconciliation of sewer costs from the region. So the 2018 number was offset by that uh, almost million dollar transfer from reserves for that reconciliation. So the, the true increase in regional fixed charges is closer to about 8% when you take away that reserve transfer. No change proposed in the fixed capital charges. Um, and again, this is in line with the BMA report. They, they didn't suggest a change in sewer for 2019. Um, changes occur later in the five year plan. The net city operating charges were reduced by 10% in an effort to offset the increase from the region. And as well, the city has re uh, increased their non-rate revenue, uh, specifically a transfer from reserves, to help <coughs> offset this, this increase from the region. So again, annual treatment costs from the region are 100% fixed. The net operating costs controlled by the city decreased by the 10%. Uh, in the sewer budget, we are also requesting a new staff member, one six-month casual seasonal laborer. The debt servicing of almost 900000 is is an, and has been offset by the contribution from DC reserves. And then again, just to highlight the capital spending, um, we covered this in the asset management thing, it's not, it's not quite enough for the asset management plan, but as the chairs pointed out, um, this is partially offset by the use of OLG contribution funds. And then for council's reference, the annual amortization is $2 million. There is a rebate program included in the wastewater budget, which is our weeping tile removal assistance program, otherwise known as our RAP program. 
There's a budget of 250,000, was previously 500,000. We reduced it this year to help offset the cost, but in the event that we exceed the 48 applications allowed, we do have a reserve fund, a special purpose reserve of about 240,000 that we could look to use to, to still satisfy any applicants above that 48. This is just a highlight of some of the capital pro, uh, projects that were funded using the contribution from the water and sewer the 4.1 million and the 4.7 million. Um, I'm not gonna read them in detail unless anyone has any questions. So the rate structure, the rate review was completed in uh, late 2016, um, and then council gave direction to move towards a 60-40 revenue collection between variable and fixed charges. Currently we have the water um, at that 60-40 allocation, but we're still working towards getting the sewer. The sewer's at 62-38, and we're still working towards uh, moving that to the 60-40, but to do it all at once is, is just a bit too much of a change. So what does this mean for our rates? Our annual charges for water, for fixed, are going up approximately $6. Our volumetric charge going up approximately $0.06. Cents. For wastewater, our fixed charge going up approximately $19, and our volumetric approximately $0.04. Cents. Our number of active accounts here, um, just highlighted for your reference, our, our largest users are one residential, which is 29,000 accounts. Um, total accounts, uh, Amber mentioned already, was the 30,000. So what does this all mean um, to the impact on the residential users? You don't really see what the impact is until you start plugging in scenarios. So we've given three scenarios for the R1 user, a low, uh, your average low water user at 88 cubic meters, your average high water user, or sorry, average water user at 184 meters, cubic meters, and your average high user at 282 cubic meters. So your average low user is going up approximately $2.80 per month. Your average user is going up approximately $3.60 per month. And your average high user is going up approximately $4.43 per month. These all result in about around a 5% change in, in their previous year's billing. For the other classes, um, I've highlighted this with percentages. Um, the percentage change based on the average consum consumption for each class. You can see that the percentages, like the R1 residential, all fall in and around um, the lowest being this 4.78 and the highest being the 5.99%. So I've included a couple slides. These are for illustration purposes. Um, I'm certainly not recommending it, but I did want to illustrate what does it look like if we did not have the $900,000 addition to capital. So our, our wastewater fixed charges would actually go down by $4.32 a year, and our volumetric would only be going up for, by um, a penny. So what does that look like? Without the capital contribution, your total monthly increase for your average user is now $2.06 as opposed to the $3.60. So essentially for an extra $1.54 a month, we can get $900,000 of capital approved and, and in the ground this year. If um, the impact on the other users, if we did not have this $900,000 $900, capital contribution, brings the percent change um, instead of four to six percent down to the, the um, about three to four percent range. This is just a chart comparing to all of the uh, local area municipalities. Uh, this is with everybody's 2019 rates with the exception of West Lincoln. Um, they haven't passed theirs yet. So you can see we're still below the average in all three categories, which uh, in my opinion means our rates are still very competitive. And then lastly, we have an update on our dashboard. So we launched this, I believe, in 2016. Um, and we currently have 3,700, over 3,700 accounts signed up on our dashboard. Um, if you want, you can go to our website, you can sign up for an account. On the dashboard, you get to see all about your bill. You can register for e-billing, you can report a meter reading, you can um, see all sorts of different statistics. So if you want to sign up, I did include a link to that for anybody interested. And then lastly, our recommendations. So we recommend that Council approve the 2019 water, wastewater budget and associated rates as presented, including the $900,000 addition to capital in the water budget. 
And we're asking that council approve the new staff positions that were mentioned within the water and wastewater budgets. Any questions? Okay, anyone have any questions of Ms. Clark? If not, then we're looking for a recommendation to approve the 2019 water wastewater budget. I have a motion by Councillor Campbell, seconded by Councillor Thompson. If there's no comments, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Those motions carried. Thank you. Uh, 9.7 is uh, Report F 2019-15, dealing with the cancellation, reduction, and refund of taxes. Looking for a motion to approve the recommendation. Motion by Councillor Strange, seconded by Councillor Dabrowski. All those in favor? Opposed? Motions carried. And I think it's time to pass the meeting back to the mayor. So we're going to do this one. Montrose Road. Is this Kent? Are you doing this one? Montrose Road. No presentation. No presentation. Okay. So we got a eight point item eight point eight moved by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Campbell, that we recon the reconstruction of Montrose Road from McLeod Road to Charnwood Avenue take place with cost sharing with the region. So we've got two recommendations. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Uh, did we do 8-7? Cancellation reduction and refund of tax? Yeah, that was done. Yeah. Uh, item 8.9, draft plan of vacant land condominium. It's an amendment to, to draft plan approval. So we've got... Um, yeah. Okay. So we've got uh, Bruno Galante, but Bruno's not here. Not you're not. You're not Bruno. No. Unfortunately, uh, he was called away for work, so he's out of town. So I'm here for him on his behalf. I'm his wife, Ivana Galante. Good evening, um, Your Worship and members of Council. Um, of course, I'm here on behalf of my husband. Uh, so please bear with me. Uh, thank you for allowing us uh, the opportunity to put forth a request to relieve us from having to install fire sprinklers in five, uh, five of the townhomes out of the seven total. Uh, that is to be built on McLeod Road. And it's a development which has already been approved uh, by council. Uh, simply put, uh, there is no current policy for the proposed sprinklers, although they may assist uh, fire department at this current time, it is not a building or a fire code. Um, so uh, we are well within the current fire code uh, by being within 90 meters from the existent hydrant um, that is um, in front of the property and also with the furthest unit of the complex, complex being about 115 feet. Um, I'll hand this out as a visual. The distance of Fire Station 2 on McLeod Road uh, to our development is only 1,800 meters, and it takes about three minutes to drive without sirens. Since two of the units that face McLeod Road are okay with no sprinkler system, um, and this was okay by the fire chief, it seems a burden to insist that the other units need the sprinklers. Um, again, the distance from the road to the furthest unit is 115 feet, and the hoses on a fire truck are 200 feet long, which would reach each unit without any problem. 
Um, our townhomes will be built according to the 2019 code and as such will be much safer than that over about 30,000 other structures with much older standards, um, structures in Niagara. Uh, the driveway will allow full access of fire truck so there are no issues getting the vehicles to the homes. Um, so our ask is to relieve us from having to install the sprinklers <clears throat> and we are hoping that uh, we can get support uh, for, from council for our request. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have any questions, first of all, for Ms. Galante? Do we have a motion? I've got Councillor Thompson, Councillor, Councillor, uh, did you want to make the motion, Council? Um, yes, I think the presentation tells the story. Um, there's only seven units there. Um, it's a very pointed piece of property, 150 feet, uh, <coughs> which is what they use as a, a measurement uh, for the trucks, fire trucks. And there's a uh, fire hall very close and a hydrant right up at the top. So I, I think it's a reasonable request and I would so move. Okay, moved by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Dabrowski. No. Any other comments? Yeah, sure. Yeah, Councillor uh, Peter Angelo. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I, I, I guess I was just going to say, I, I know that this issue has uh, caused some debate in the past, and you know, sometimes Council has been supportive of the fire department, and uh, uh, other times we haven't. I, I think it's reasonable if you say that you're within the distance of the fire hose uh, that you wouldn't have to put sprinklers in. So, I mean, if the fire hoses can go 200 feet, I mean, I know we don't have a formalized policy, um, but perhaps that should be a benchmark. I mean, I don't think that it should just be something that we impose on someone just uh, as of right or, you know, because we can. I mean, I think that with, if you're within the distance of a fire hose, then it's reasonable that you wouldn't have to install them. If you're outside of that range, then I can see us con uh, considering it. So I gladly support the motion to not install them. Okay. If there's no further comments, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay. Against? Okay. That's approved. Thank you very oh, much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. <coughs> Item uh, TS 2019-11, Cattell Drive Parking Control. There's a recommendation that no stopping zone between the hours of 8 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. Monday to Friday be established. Moved by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Dabrowski. All those in favor? That's approved, thank you. Now on to the consent agenda. What's the direction of Council on the consent agenda? Moved by Councillor, uh, I only second by Councillor Dabrowski that we move the consent agenda. Is there any, does anyone want anything removed before we do that on the consent agenda? Okay, then we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Moving the consent, thank you. Uh, and I'll just quickly run through what we just approved. Uh, the monthly tax receivable reports for March, um, municipal accounts for finance, fire station for lease agreement in Chippewa, mutual assistance agreement for emergency management, PBD 2019 telecommunication facility consultation extension request on Marshall Road, revision of the registered condominium description on Main Street in Chippewa, Removal of part lot control, Warren Woods. The Junior B renewal agreement. Fee waiver applications for Ann Meyer High School and Niagara Falls International Marathon. Bus le lease with Mississauga bus, coach, and truck repair. Dell Avenue intersection control reviews. Okay, now on to communications and comments of the city clerk. So item 10.1. Proclamation request, World Hepatitis Day, July 28th. Moved by Councillor Strange, second by Councillor Campbell that we make that uh, proclamation. All those in favor? That's approved, thank you. Uh, proclamation request Niagara from Niagara Falls Museums requesting that May be proclaimed as Museum Month. Moved by Councillor Lococo, second by Councillor Campbell. All those in favor? That's approved. 10.3, noise bala exemption request from Big Texas on Ferry Street for Tuesday, May the 21st, 7 p.m. till midnight. Moved by Councillor Strange, seconded by Councillor Thompson. All those in favor? That's approved. 
Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority resolution regarding the extension of the current temporary members of the NPCA. So they're just asking that we appoint an interim group moved by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Dabrowski. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Regional Niagara MOU for Planning Function Services. Um, there's a memorandum of understanding for planning function and services between the region and the local area municipalities. There's a recommendation that we refer this to staff for a report for our next meeting. Okay, moved by Councillor Strange, seconded by Councillor Thompson. All those in favor? That's approved, thank you. 10.6, Regional Niagara, various correspondence. So this is, the recommendation is that we receive this uh, information. There are five pieces of, con of uh, correspondence from the region. Looking for a motion to receive. Moved by Councillor Strange, second by Councillor Lococo. Did you want to speak to one of them? I don't know, Mr. Clerk, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, I haven't either. It seems like they've been sending us a lot of correspondence and it's just been for information. Uh, so because of that, I thought I would just lump them all together. Uh, if, if council wanted to pull one of those and, and discuss it, that would be fine. Yeah, I haven't heard as to, as to why that direction has changed, but uh, I'm just following along the correspondence that's been sent along. Okay, we'll call that vote. All those in favor? Okay, thank you. That was the vote of Councilor Peter Angel seeking old candidate at the next meeting. You just missed the vote. <laughs> you know why you're that. You know why you're that. Uh, item 10.7, City of Brantford resolution on single-use plastic straws. Um, recommendation is that we just receive and file. We've already made our own motion here. Sounds good. Okay, moved by Councilor Peter Angel, seconded by Councilor Dubrowski. All those in favor? That's approved. Item 10.8, letter of no objection. Uh, regarding cowboy mounted shooting so <laughs> I feel weird even saying that but um, yeah they're shooting blanks uh, out, in, uh, out in the country <laughs> yeah oh good so motion by Councillor Thompson second by Councillor Strange all those in favor that's approved you guys are terrible uh, resolutions um, PBD 2019 uh, draft plan of vacant land condominium, therefore be resolved that subject to the Planning Act, Council deems the modification to the condominiums of draft plan of vacant land condominium to be minor and exempt from the requirement for a written notice. So we're looking for, uh, do you want to say something, Mr. Clerk? Is, this is just in relation to what Council just passed yeah. on the PBD report 2019-27. This is just a formal resolution. Okay, okay that's moved by Councilor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councilor Campbell. All those in favor? That's approved. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Levich. So to the clerk's point, that is a resolution for Mr. and Mrs. Galante, but it does speak in there that we would exempt them for units one and two for the fire uh, sprinklers. We want to also amend this resolution so that it's, it's all units one to seven. One to seven. Okay, that's good by the mover. Uh, okay, by the second or two, Councillor Campbell. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right, that's good. So that's uh, we'll recall that vote. All those in favor? The resolution. Thank you. Um, moving on to ratification of in camera, Mr. Clerk. Uh, nothing to ratify. Okay. Uh, the bylaws. Uh, Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Dabrowski, that the bylaws be given a first, second, and third reading. All those in favor? That's approved. And on to new business. Councillor Iannone. Thank you. First thing is Project Share is launching their Wear Red campaign. And they were asking if at the next council meeting in May, if all of council can wear a red shirt for their Wear Red campaign. And they will also provide us Project Share Red wear red shirts if you will give me your sizes they will make sure everybody has one before may 14th so can i make a motion that council support and wear red is yep. that how you want it done motion by councillor iononi second by councillor lococo that council supports the pro may 14th yep, the project yep. share, share wear red campaign at our next council meeting on may the 14th and i'll get us shirts and we'll give the sizes to councillor iononi and she'll get us uh the shirts. Project share shirts all those in favor 
And that's approved. And also, I have communication from a resident who lives in Fernwood subdivision. And if we could refer this to staff, they said that there's sidewalks between Eagle Ridge Drive and Jake Crescent and Fiddlehead are in terrible shape that the city's been out many times and all they're doing is patching it and it's gotten progressively worse. And he would like to have someone, and he said he has suggested many times that it needs to be new as opposed to continuing to fix things that continue to break. If we could have staff go out and take a look at it, I will forward his name and the pictures and have them maybe bring back to council if we have to make a motion to have those sidewalks changed. Okay, All right. so motion by Councillor Iannone, second by Councillor Dabrowski, that we refer that street to staff in yeah. Fernwood. I will send them the emails. And she'll send, uh, yeah. Okay, all those in favor? And that's approved. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other new business of Council? Yes, Councillor Peter Angelo. Am I the only one person? <laughs> Fingers crossed. Oh, no, oh, Councillor oh, Dabrowski. Oh, you had to say it, didn't He you? felt sorry for you. But you want to go left? Oh, oh, pull in rank here, veteran Councillor. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, Your Worship, I only have two items. Uh, first of all, I just sent all the council a picture, but it's for the second item. Yeah, you can look at it. it, it I don't read my phone during council meetings. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're going to really? eat words one day. Pinocchio's yeah. nose is growing. <laughs> yeah, no one has proof of that one, Your Worship. <laughs> um, so the first one, Your Worship, is I just wanted to follow up on the, uh, um, the issue of the 405 and making it fully functional. Mm -hmm. um, I know I floated the idea, like last council term, but it seems that everywhere I go, um, people continue to stop me and say to me, hey, how's the 405 going? Is it ever gonna be fully functional? And I, I know my motion was to send a resolution to the region asking them to support uh, making it fully functional and then sending that on to the MTO. I'm just wondering if you can give us uh, some feedback as to where that is. And if we haven't gotten any traction with the region, can we simply bypass them? I know it's a good idea, Your Worship. Um, we continue to have large, heavy vehicles on uh, Thorlstone, on Mountain Road. They have to go back and forth across our city every single day. The infrastructure, being the 405, is already there. Those industries would use that highway if they could actually take it westbound and then go into Niagara Falls, or if they're headed north and then take it east over towards the bridge. So. Wondering if you can give me an update, Your Worship. I would love to. Um, so everyone realizes that when you try to, when you come over the um, Queenston Lewiston Bridge, and if you want to come toward Fort Erie or come toward Niagara Falls, the only way to do it is by cutting through the city. The highways, as Councillor Peter Angelo says, it's not fully functional. So uh, right now, the region has a study going on. They have engineers and consultants, and they're looking at the Glendale exit and they're trying to redesign it. And one of the points I brought up with is there's a lot of people there that are lost and they're on their way toward Toronto because they didn't know how to go the other way because there is no other way. So they get off there and then they get instructions and Glendale's congested. And I said, you could remove thousands of cars if you had a proper way. So I've said it uh, at least three public meetings at the region. They always make notes and every time I bring it up again, they go, oh, well, we weren't aware of that. We'll have to follow up. So maybe we need to formalize this. Uh, and I like what Councilor Peter Angel is, is saying. And the Minister of Transportation is, he's an excellent uh, minister. You know, he brought the GO four years earlier. I met with him when we brought the GO. Minister Yurk, he's uh, on the ball. I think if we were able to engage him uh, and send a resolution to the region concurrently and say we, this is a priority, we need it to be looked at. It's gonna help the Glendale uh, exchange. It's gonna help the whole region and it's gonna make that highway much more functional. Rather than saying your only option is cut through the city of Niagara Falls to work your way to where you're going. And especially, there's a lot of commercial truck traffic that goes over that bridge. That is the commercial bridge here in this part of the, uh, reg the region. And then of course, Peace Bridge is the other one. And they're all gonna have to cut through the city of Niagara Falls to get going the other way. It's ridiculous that that isn't uh, fully functional. And I love the idea, and I think that would be the way to go. And let's go a two-pronged approach. Yeah, the other thing I thought of, Your Worship, is uh, AMO is coming up in August, and it's yes. really not too far away. Yes. Um, so would it be possible to coordinate with, I would imagine, Niagara on the Lake, St. Catharines, and Niagara Falls, because we would have the most to gain in terms of the 405 being fully functional. So set up a meeting at AMO yeah. with the minister, and I think it would be great to have all the reps from the different uh, cities there 
uh, asking for that from uh, from the minister. So I don't know what type of motion you'd like, but I know that I would uh, like to get things moving. Um, uh, I'd like a meeting coordinated at uh, AMO yeah. uh, with the three cities and I'd the like, region. Yeah, and I'd like it to go and I'd like it to go back to the region. I still believe that the region would support the initiative of making the 405 fully functional. And then the third thing is I'd like the minister to be either notified or invited to the city of Niagara Falls to at least view the area. Okay, so then uh, first part, uh, set up a meeting with the Minister of Transportation at AMO. Yep. Second part, that we send a resolution uh, to the region to endorse um, the fully functionality of the 405, that we invite the minister down here to see firsthand uh, what we're talking about. And was there a, was there a fourth thing? That was the third. Councillor Iononi, did you want to? Well, on that, at, or, or is, at AMO, CN Rail also has a booth set up. They also do an FCM. Can we ask to meet with CN Rail too, yep. so that we can all talk to the representatives of, for those of us that are there, could talk to the representatives of CN Rail? Yep. They're, and usually FCM is where they're, they're at. FCM. Are you going to FCM? I'm planning to. Yes, yeah, so yeah. Councillor Lecoque and I are registered to go. So. I don't, do you have to be with us for us to have a meeting no, with them? No, you can have your own meeting. No, no, I don't want our own meeting. Oh. I'm just saying for those that go, that's not what I meant. For those that go, all of us can meet with CN and have the discussion in regards to the possibility of, yep. or probability of the Rails being removed. They, have a, they always sponsor a luncheon, CN does. Yeah, and, I've sat in it many times. And that's the one, and usually if uh, the senior people are there, like uh, the VPs and up, yep. then that's a good place to go, for sure. So we can set up a meeting with them. Oh, we should absolutely. Okay. And by then, hopefully, we should have a maybe get an update from our uh, transportation department. Will we have our reports ready by um, by August? Oh no, that's no, FCM. That's email. FCM is uh, May, end of May, beginning of June. How close will we be by then? Uh, the report won't be ready for the beginning of May or the end of May, uh, but it will be ready for August at that time. Yeah, but either way, we can have the conversation yeah. with them. Yeah, well, we've had. So it. can that be a, an amendment to you? Thank you. Okay, um, but amendment, that's a 405, that your motion's on a 405. Yeah, yeah. that's just I, added. I think she just wants to make sure. AMO on there. Oh, yeah. No, a CN for right. either one, yeah. Okay, all right, so uh, we'll call, you know what, I'm gonna separate them. Okay. That, let's make the 405 one, 405. keep it clean. Yep. Okay, so we'll call, is there any other questions or comments on making the 405 fully functional, engaging the region, the Minister of Transportation? Seconder. Uh, seconder for Councillor Peter Angel's motion, uh, Councillor Dabrowski. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. So then and I move that staff send a, a letter setting up a meeting with CN at either AMO or FCM. Okay, uh, seconded by Councillor Lacocco. Okay, we'll call that vote as well. All those in favor? Okay, and that's also approved unanimously. Uh, do you have more on you? Yes, of course. Y yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Um, so my second item is uh, recently council was made aware through the notice of a public meeting that. Uh, there's been an application to, um, I guess, operate a, a cannabis farm on Meisner Road. We've all received a number of uh, emails, probably calls from residents on this as well. Um, Your Worship, I think the public meeting was last Thursday. I know uh, Councillor Lococo, Councillor Cario, and myself were able to make it. I understand that the rest of Council, uh, you know, um, we all have things to do. So I sent everyone a picture anyway of uh, just, so the meeting started off downstairs. Uh, we quickly figured out that uh, downstairs wasn't big enough. So we came up to council chambers. Council chambers still wasn't big enough. Um, not to make light of the situation, but uh, even if we're cleaning out a major drain in the rural area, I don't think we've ever had that many residents from the rural area come for one single issue. So Your Worship, I know that um, we kind of, kicked around where uh, cannabis production would go in the past. Originally we had it in industrial areas um, and then we dealt with two applications. I think those applications were sort of in the wrong place just simply because they were so close to residential. Uh, after that the council of the day made a decision to allow cannabis production in agricultural areas um, but only under site specific zoning. So in other words uh, the applications would have to come back to City Council for approval. Um, you know, given what's happened in other municipalities, I'm not convinced anymore that that is the best decision either. Uh, I know that uh, um, at our farmer's market, we have a DeVries fruit farm. 
I love his apples. I'm very loyal. Uh, he's not there in January and February, so I have to go all the way out to Fenwick. Uh, this year when I went out to Fenwick, I, I, I got the pleasure of passing one of those colony of skunks that they call grow ops uh, or a greenhouse. Uh, Your Worship, I can't imagine putting that next to someone's house. I really can't. Um, I don't know that we've made the best decision in terms of where they go. Uh, my feelings now are that, you know, they need to be in industrial areas. And um, my thoughts were to enact an, in, enact an interim control by law and study the situation more and look at what other municipalities have done and the problems that they've had. And then this council can make a decision on where we feel these uses are best suited. So that would be my motion, Your Worship, is that we enact an interim control bylaw and that we study the situation some more. Situation comes back to council and then we make another decision. And I think right now we have a lot of examples out there that we almost know what not to do. And then I'm sure that we can find some examples where we'll say, okay, this is what we're going to do. So that would be my motion. Okay, worship. that's moved by Councilor Peter Angelo and seconded by Councilor Campbell. Yes, Your Worship, I, I, I want to second that. Um, I do believe when that bylaw was passed, no one anticipated an outdoor grow up. Yeah. Right. Right? It's I mean, always domed. Yeah. yeah, it was always, in my mind, it was always going to be indoors. And I think you're absolutely right. We've got to have another look at that. But just, it's not right. Thank you. All right, thank you for that. So moved and seconded. Uh, Councilor Iannone. And to that, I think we had this discussion when we talked about Red Path Sugar, it possibly going, a, a grow up going out there. I think anything that has to be fortified, lit up like an airport, and cameraed so that you can find a, a squirrel peeing a block away in a field should not be beside residence homes. I th think the same now as I did then, and I think we really need to take another look at it. Do we have any other questions or comments of council for this? And I want to add to the uh, conversation. I did receive a lot of calls uh, and emails, and these people are quite emotional about it, and I absolutely uh, empathize with them. I, and the question I always ask myself, would I want to live next to this? And I absolutely would not. And these are people who are living next to a chicken farm right now. And for anyone that's been out in the country, chicken farms are probably the worst smelling. Uh, and Councillor Peter Angelo was filling me in. Why is it that chicken farms are the worst smelling? Um, well, the manure is very potent, Your Worship, as compared to other animals. That's what it is. You said there was another reason. They, they take it out every day or something? Or what were you saying? Uh, it, it goes out more frequent than the other animals, a lot of the other animals, because it doesn't go out that often. So. Why do you know this? <laughs> yeah, he, grew up in the farm. he grew up in a farm. <laughs> so no, no, my dad always had animals, but we never had a chicken farm. Uh, my dad just liked to have animals, so you name it, we had it. We had cows, we had pigs, we had horses, we had sheep, we had chickens, we had goats, we had everything. So, so, so as a result, if they're not happy, if they're they'd rather have a chicken farm than yeah. this, it tells you how significant uh, that would be to the impact on their enjoyment of the quality of life in their yard. So anyway, we've got the motion, we've got it seconded. We'll call that vote, all those in favor. And that's unanimous. So good job, Vic. Any other uh, new business? Uh, Councillor Dabrowski. Um, I failed to mention check 425666, my $100 refund earlier this meeting. Um, as well, and I'll write that out and give it to the city clerk. It's too late. <laughs> it's right there. It's in um, Wednesday, May 7th, on another note, is McHappy Day. I'm not sure if yeah. anyone else is participating. I'll be out on McLeod Road at 11 a.m. if anyone wants to come and try one of them. famous or sampling? Big, both. Okay. <laughs> sampling first, okay. then serving. But uh, it's a great, great organization. Obviously, the Ronald McDonald House, it's a great event as well. So if anyone's not busy next Wednesday, May 7th, or already volunteering, uh, feel free to come out. That's it for me. Yeah, next Wednesday, get to McDonald's, support Ronald McDonald House. 11 o'clock. Excellent, Road. excellent cause. Seen for so many it is. Any other new business? Okay, looking for a motion for adjournment. Councillor uh, Strange, second by Councillor Dabrowski. All those in favor? And that's approved. Thank you. Yeah.